Cool. So um, I'm here with David Foster. Welcome to MLST. Well, thanks very much for having me on. Pleasure to be here. Amazing. Well, um, David is very, very well known because he wrote this book, Generative Deep Learning. And I myself read this book in about 2018 or 19 when it first came out. And there's now a second edition. And we're going to be running a competition, actually. So um, I think what we're going to do, we've got three ebooks to give away. And the three best comments on the YouTube, right? Unfortunately, we don't have podcast comments. Um, the three best high effort comments, we will send you an ebook. So there you go. You've got two weeks. Um, anyway, so in the second edition of the book, um, I'm just looking at the table of contents. So there's a chapter on generative modeling, deep learning, uh, some of the methods, so variational autoencoders, GANs, autoregressive models, normalizing flow models, energy based models, and diffusion models. And then you speak about some of the applications. So there's transformers, advanced GANs, music generation, and world models, and multimodal models. So um, why don't you just give us a little bit of a story about the first edition of the book? What was it like to write it? And what's coming now in this second edition? Yeah, well, thanks again for having me on. Pleasure to be here. Um, I feel, yeah, this whole journey of writing this book has been, I feel like I've completely overlapped with how generative modeling has evolved over the last five years um, from a very niche field back in 2018 when I first started writing through to now probably the hottest topic in tech, I would say. And I think the process of writing the book has been one that I've had to keep up with the latest trends and technologies. And I think what I hope comes across in the book is that it, this is a book for beginners because we're all beginners ultimately with a lot of these technologies. There's no there's very few people who can honestly say that have been working for, with this field for you know, 10, 20 years. So I hope what's coming across in the book is that anyone can pick this up and start becoming an expert with based models such as variation autoencoders, I think are a fantastic place to start and get, you know, get, get working with these kind of technologies, but then quickly moving on to state of the art like transformers and diffusion models. Um, so yeah, I feel very privileged to be in the position where I can write this book. And it's, yeah, it's been, it's been a fascinating journey for me personally, but also to see this field evolve has been been fantastic really really exciting fantastic so let's talk a bit about the landscape of, of some of these models so i mean going back in time a little bit there's been a real trend towards this concept of self-supervised learning mm -hmm. so we kind of like use the data to train on essentially we're seeing that with um, transformers and language models we're seeing it with vision models so sketch out the landscape. Yeah. Um, okay. So generative modeling really you know, spans, I would say, six main families of model. Um, you've got one of the first kinds of model that were introduced, variation autoencoders back in t late 2013. Um, you've then got things like GAN. So this is where we're treating the problem as a almost as a competition between the generator and the discriminator. Um, we're looking for the generator to get stronger as a result of the discriminator also getting stronger and being able to detect what is fake and what is real. Um, you've then got some fairly sort of niche kinds of model that I think are also very important to learn about. So normalizing flows being one of them. Um, this is where we look to enact a change of variables on uh, the domain in order that we can simplify the problem and we constrain the way in which the model is set up um, so that we can reverse the process. So we can move from image to noise, but also from noise to image. Energy space models are uh, another kind of family. I would say they are the predecessor of some of the state-of-the-art image, text-to-image models, such as uh, diffusion models. Um, and again, they they look to uh, almost treat the um, the process of generating an image as a as a landscape through which you're uh, moving, and you have to find the way to move along this landscape in a way that moves towards realistic images and away from those that aren't as realistically generated. Um, and then, of course, yes, there's transformers, but that's part of a wider set of models called autoregressive models. Um, so many of your listeners, I'm sure, will have heard of things like LSTMs and uh, GRUs. They're early forms of autoregressive models where you're always trying to predict a few, one usually one time step ahead. Um, so whether that's one word or one token, transformers do the same thing, but they just do it using a different mechanism called attention. Um, so they're not recurrent in nature. It means they're easily paralyzable. And they are now obviously state of the art for things like you know, GPT um, as a decoder style transformer. But then there's other model types like uh, T5, which is encoder decoder. Um, and then you've got other kinds of transformers as well, like BERT, which aren't necessarily generative, but uh, are still very important for, um, for natural language understanding. Uh, the final type of model is the diffusion model. Um, so this is where companies like Stability AI have really um, made progress with their stable diffusion 
model and i would say most of the state-of-the-art uh, text to image models these days are based around diffusion um but that's not to say that you know we need to just throw all of the other kinds of model like gans out of the window because actually a lot of the ideas from GANs, such as having a discriminator to be able to tell fake from real images, are still very much used in models like uh, VQGAN um, and the earlier um, uh, VQVAE. So we need to remember when we're, when we're studying generative modeling, not just to go after the latest fad and the latest model type, because just around the corner, there may be a completely new idea that borrows concepts from normalizing flows or borrows concepts from energy energy based models you know a few years ago gans were all the rage so when anybody could talk about was gans you know it was a new gan every week and suddenly out of nowhere comes diffusion models in 2020 um there's a whole new idea and suddenly those who understood energy based models were at the forefront of the field because they could they could talk about this and build models that were just so much more powerful in so many ways um and so i think what i've tried to do with this book is lay out the landscape and say look this is where we are today uh, who knows where we're going to be in another five years time, whether it will still be transformers we're talking about or whether it's going to be something else, um, whether it's going to be diffusion models or we're going to swing back to GANs in some way. I think what's important is that we keep a broad mind when we're studying a field like this, because what's certain is that it will move fast and those who understand it from scratch will be the ones in the best place to take advantage of it. So um, there's something really interesting about recurrence in, in general. So you, you spoke about these autoregressive models like RNNs, LSTMs, transformers, and mm -hmm. so on. And um, recurrence is actually something which is in diffusion models and even in cellular automata. So there's something very interesting about um, over a fixed number of time steps, iterating and iterating. And um, it's the same thing in, in cellular automata. Mm -hmm. You're diffusing information through time. It's a great way of kind of like moving information around. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also an interesting difference between recursive and recurrence. Um, they're different mm -hmm. computational models entirely. Now, Jan LeCun recently tweeted saying that there's a big problem with autoregressive language models, and it's because of these exponentially diverging trajectories. And because he said <clears throat> they accumulate so much error, they're not really the path forward, as well mm -hmm. as the computational limitations of having to run them sequentially. So it's almost like remarkable that language models and diffusion models work at all. I mean, why do they work and why is there not mode collapse, for example? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. It's it's a miracle that they work as well as they do. I think if you ask people, you know, at the start of the GPT revolution, whether they thought in five years time, we would be looking at something we're talking about as AGI. I don't think many people would say that that would be the case. You know, you might be able to, in some small part, produce text, perhaps on a smaller domain. Um, but to say that it's a general AGI is, is quite remarkable. I think this this stuff shouldn't be possible. You know, I think a lot of what we're what we base our societal norms on assumes that you can't predict text well enough to mimic intelligence. And so you mentioned you know recurrence, and I think it's a really interesting dichotomy between generative models and discriminative models. Um, and actually, I, I like to think of generative models almost as the limit of a discriminative model where you know, t goes to zero and you're collapsing everything to just understanding the data rather than trying to predict something into the future transformers they almost collapse it to zero but they're just trying to predict one step ahead so that it's kind of falling over itself and and constantly trying to predict one word at a time and who would have thought that you know just predicting one word ahead could mimic intelligence and fool people i think that's the shock here that's what's it's not a particular model type or a particular way of thinking about ai it's the fact that very very simple prediction can lead to something that we are fooled by as 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 agi and i know i don't think we're there yet but i think what we need to understand is if this simple idea can get us this far maybe this is this is a significant component of a a more substantial kind of ai um that you know really just focuses on on simple ideas like predicting one step ahead maybe with memory functions built in or goal-oriented behavior as we're seeing with things like auto gpt now and maybe that will lead to true agi you know i don't know whether that's that's going to be the case but i think you know what's interesting to see is that we can get so far with such a simple idea um, and it's often the most elegant ideas isn't it that that are the correct ones um you know we've seen this with with in the field of physics and, and other other areas where the simpler the idea the more likely it is to to cause you know huge huge shock waves, I guess, across the across the field. And this is just another example of that. Yeah, it, it, I think it, it was it was a surprise to everyone. 
and these autoregressive models because they're, they're, there's always a discussion between connectionist models and traditional mm -hmm. cognitive models or even like the von neumann architecture mm -hmm. <clears throat> because they they have um, a separate addressable memory but now with these autoregressive models it's almost like the previous iterations become a memory because they're they're fed back in mm -hmm. but they are still truncated models but surprisingly they've kind of taught us that uh, language and even art is schematic mm -hmm. and it's very very predictable and then there's the philosophy of well you know if mimicry is uh, sufficiently indistinguishable from the real thing mm. is there is there an actual um difference yeah exactly and i think um you know we're looking at things like you know vector databases now as being that memory store um so yeah people are now thinking of the gpt model as the almost like the um the, the action taker and or how, how do we how do we take information from this vector database and push it into something new into the future um, but also, you know, compression of ideas and compression of information has always been a, a large problem of creating intelligence because, um, you know, it's 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 often the case that we're well, we we are bombarded bombarded with information, and we have to decide as humans how much of this do we want to store, how much do we want to throw away, what do we want to compress it down into, um, do we need to compress it so much that it doesn't really matter if we can't decompress it into perfect information? Is that good enough to survive? Um, and so we're coming up with exactly the same problem now with uh, with autoaggressive models and, and transformers. You know, how much do we want to take previous memory of what's been said um, and store this as part of a, a compressible vector that you can then just reference at inference time? Um, obviously, too much compression and you 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 destroy the very nature of what you're trying to remember, and then not enough, and you've 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 bloated your memory full of things that you don't need to remember at all. So I think what's going to be interesting is this blend between the um, the creative and, and almost action taking GPT style decoder model and static memory stores. Um, we're starting to see you know, companies like Pinecone um, it, with vector databases really, yeah, start to take the forefront of this and say, look, this is how you need to, as a company, start working with GPT models because they are, you know, they are limited in their nature of their context window. So. You know, as a company, it's all very well to sort of just prompt a GPT and get a response, but ultimately there needs to be some sort of store of your company's information so that you can actually pull, you know, live information from a database. Um, and the the interplay between this and the, the the large language model is going to be super interesting, I think, going forward. Yeah, in interesting. So there's there's always been this philosophical divide between GoFi people who thought that knowledge must be certain, mm -hmm. it must be a causally determined model. And they say that's how science works. Mm -hmm. You deduce new facts when you have a causally determined model. And now we're in this this slightly different philosophy, which is a probabilistic philosophy. Mm. And we can store lots of information. We can retrieve it from vector uh, vector databases. We can do retrieval augmented generation. And we're doing very kind of probabilistic. It's kind of maximum likelihood estimation as well. I mean, we're mm -hmm. talking about energy based models and yeah. you know, GPT works and, and so on. But um, but we we get these results that are very very lifelike. They mimic intelligence mm -hmm. but they are we know they are kind of like paradigmatically different right yeah exactly and i think you know when we look back maybe five ten years down the road w i wonder how much of what we consider to be the cutting edge will still be transformer and decoder style models and how much will have swung towards the symbolic um you know, e expression of intelligence that's that's uh you know, I guess promoted by the, you know, Gary Marcus and so on, where they're saying, look, we need something else here. This isn't enough. We can't just probabilistically um, you know, and stochastically jump our way to intelligence. We have to, in some way, have a store that we seem to have as humans where we can't make the mistake of if someone says, give me 100 cities in the UK or towns beginning with the letter um, S, we can't make a mistake on three of them because it's obvious to us. And, and so um, it's, it's not something that we would even make with a, a tiny percentage probability. And you know, the challenge, I guess, with probabilistic models is that they will always have, they will always assign some non-zero probability, even to the most, the least likely events. And it seems that we don't, we seem to be able to zero probabilities. Now, what mechanism we use to do that, we don't really know. Um, you know, we've, we've obviously bu built up neural networks by and large as a model of how things work in the brain and i know many people would say you know they're very different and that's true and how the brain works and how neural networks work are fundamentally different but there's un it's undeniable there are parallels and so you know we as as neural networks work out of the box there is no way to easily zero a probability without some sort of forcing of that information mm. onto the model 
they will backpropagate error, but not to the point where you're going to ever, you know, push a zero probability out to a particular output node. So, you know, how do we how do we build this in? There needs to be new ideas, I think, that come to generative modeling to actually push the hard factual information into the model without it being purely probabilistic. Yeah. Yeah. And I, th I think this gets to the core, the miracle of human cognition is that the, the world is actually infinite. Mm -hmm. as, as Chomsky said, there's no such thing as the probability of a sentence. Mm. And um, but there is there is a surface. So we have the ability to construct an abstract world model. And what we're basically doing is is we're discarding this this infinity, right? The the Mm -hmm. domain is infinite mm. and um and that's kind of like what energy-based models do they're a very clever way of like taking something which is very large and representing it as an unnormalized probability distribution so gary marcus would say well a gps is really good because it has an abstract world model mm -hmm. and that world model um you know it might still be a probabilistic one but ideally let's say it, it's a causally determined model we can just create these models on the fly all over the place now, people have said that large language models are a theory of linguistics. Mm. And in, in a way they are, right? Because they have learned to structure the world that we live in into this representation space. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very useful. But it doesn't really answer the question of, is there an intelligible symbolic decomposition of the world that could be derivable in a similar way? Mm. And even if it existed, would we understand it and would it be useful? Yeah, I, I think there's a couple of things to sort of mention there. First of all, isn't it interesting that language seems to be a mechanism through which we can very, very accurately, more so than you would think from a stream of tokens, describe the complexity of reality. And does that maybe speak to a, a deeper truth about what language is? Is it necessary for intelligence? Maybe it's so. Maybe maybe we've always thought that language comes out of us being a species that is intelligent and the causality is that way. But what about if it was the other way? What about if language is a necessary component for true intelligence? And the reason is that we can, to, to be intelligent, it is necessary to be able to decompose reality into a stream of tokens. Um, you know, I think that's a really interesting idea is that, you know, we've always sort of saw, seen language and linguistics as a, an offshoot of intelligence and that we need to first of all understand intelligence and then we'll understand how language works and why we why babies learn language the way they do but what if we need to understand language first and that will give us i think what we're seeing now is that gives us secrets to intelligence that were previously hidden um you know we, we, we're almost doing this the other way around we still haven't understood intelligence but we're suddenly really making strides in language generation and that is has suddenly shone this spotlight onto what, what intelligence is that previously wasn't there. Um, so that that's the first thing I think, you know, wh which way around is the causality. Um, but then, yeah, also uh, the point I made just before around how, how much of reality can be actually truly represented by a stream of tokens, even though we live in a three-dimensional spatial world from one time dimension, that we can compress this into a uh, effectively a one-dimensional line of tokens. Um, and that there is enough of that captured by that stream that we can we can decompress that into using our own brains into back into what reality looks like to us. We can read things and it really does give the impression of true reality. Um, so I, I think what's going to be interesting in future, you mentioned world models. So at the moment, we've got a very, very strong world model called GPT-4. And that world model is based on a world where only tokens exist. There is no notion of objects. There's no notion of uh, time. There is no notion of uh, movement, action, observation. It's just a stream of integers, effectively. That's it. So what happens if we apply the same technology and the same um, theory where the medium through which it is operating isn't tokens and integers and text, but what if we throw other things into the mix? So we seem to, as humans, not treat vision as a stream of tokens. And obviously a lot of models these days don't necessarily tokenize the input. But, you know, can we build a world, a world model that isn't just, and this goes back to Likun's point, I think, um, he wants to build world models that are incredibly rich so that the, the, the decoding, if you like, of, you know, something like a GPT doesn't operate on tokens, but it op opens on a much richer understanding of the environment. Um, and I think action taking is something that I think is going to become in the next five years, something extraordinarily important to 
all aspects of what we consider AI to be. Um, at the moment, GPT doesn't have anything to say about action taking beyond, well, treat it like another token. And you can play a game within GPT because it just treats everything as tokens. But do we need to treat actions taking separately? Do we need to really think about this as a, a different mechanism through which um, we embed information and receive information from large language models? So yeah, I, I, I think you're right though that you know it's the, the, the relationship between language and reality is much tighter than we thought. You know, it's not doesn't seem to just be a um, a happy offshoot of you know intelligence that we you know it's wonderful that we can all talk. It seems to be a necessity. It seems to be something that's really important to uh, and give give the impression of true intelligence. So who knows where that's going to lead? But so much yeah. so much to think about there. I know um, it, it seems to be so important. It might be almost platonic or something very primitive and, exactly. and very very deep about it. Um, I wanted to touch on a couple of things you said. I mean, first of all, I'm, I'm a big fan of Lacoon and his Jepper architecture. Mm -hmm. You know, but we've done lots of shows on, on all of his stuff. But he's always had this idea of using self-supervised learning and um, deliberately creating a rich representation space because he said as soon as you supervise, mm -hmm. um, there's a wonderful image in his Dino paper where he kind of like showed the richness of the representation space becoming truncated. But unfortunately, as soon as you fine tune a model, even to perform actions, you, you suffer this similar truncation of mm -hmm. the representation space. And I wanted to talk a little bit about what you were saying before, which is that um, we think of language as being a little bit extra, a bit like Dave, David Chalmers thinks of consciousness as being a little bit extra. Mm -hmm. And um, early neuroscientists like Paul McLean thought of the parts of the brain as being kind of like a bit like geologi geological strata that you had the old monkey brain and now you've yeah. got this neocortex on the top and it works in isolation. Well it, well, it doesn't. They're all very tightly entangled. And it's the same thing with language that... Um, we've now got this amazing research that um, can um, produce, you know, like we can look at the representations of subjective states like colors. Mm. They're very similar to how we represent colors. Mm -hmm. And that shows that there's a kind of bi-directional entanglement between language and our subjective experience. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's quite difficult really for us to separate language from any other type of experience. But what we do know is that animals clearly think without language, right? So, um, yeah, it's. I, I think it also gets into this semantics point in in general, which is um, like there's some wonderful research from um, Celeste Kidd. She's a, a psychologist. She did this study about um, what do people understand as the concept of a penguin, mm -hmm. and she asked loads of people, and and she she asked some very very clever questions about comparing penguins to other things, mm -hmm. and she noticed that there were a, about fifty clusters, I think. So people understand penguins in different ways, mm. and. Um, this all points down to we we represent concepts as a symbol and a concept is just a bag of analogies and we think we're communicating and having a common understanding but mm. we're really not right mm. you know and that's the reason why people argue with each other we have very very different understandings and that's because we all have semantic maps between concepts and our world model mm. yeah i think you know if i look at my own 8 month year old daughter now and i'm always amazed at how much she seems to be taking on in the world without necessarily having the expression back to to kind of represent that her own way so you're you're right i think that you know people whether it's penguins or or otherwise have different ways of representing the same concept and that will depend hugely on a person's own experience it will depend on their own ability to um to take on information but then i think as well we need to also think how does that reflect on ai and and the question of you know what data sets ai is trained on is obviously critical because that will that will depend that will that will necessarily um, inform their own representation of a particular subject, and I think we're seeing this now with you know the questions coming up around data and how it how it's being used within AI models should be more transparent because you're right that the representations that are being formed are necessarily a function of the data that it's been trained on whether that's human or AI. Um, so yeah, I, I think you know. It's really interesting. I saw a comment as well from Francois Cholet uh, the other day saying about how his um, how his son was able to, you know, with so few examples of the uh, the concept in the real world, be able to point to say a ghost on the page of his book without ever seeing a ghost in that particular form. Um, now, how does that happen? That's something that is quite remarkable, isn't it? That we can maybe see a handful of examples of what a ghost is, and even fewer where it's labelled, and still 
whether through super, self-supervised learning or otherwise, be able to map that onto new information into the future? I don't think we really have an answer to that at the moment, even through you know, the large language models and the like, um, to have that level, that level of um, few shot or zero shot learning. Um, they're very good large language models at a certain kind of few shot or, 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 uh, or zero shot learning. But I think to introduce a completely new concept um, in so much noisy information, we have to remember that you know large language models are still being prompted with a, a, a effectively a, a 1D flow of, of integer tokens, whereas humans are being bombarded with five senses, they're being bombarded with noise, there's a huge amount of... Um, they need to understand what to pay attention to and what not. And I think we've seen how this works in large language models where we, we, we need to pay attention to this stream of tokens. But how do you do that when you have five streams of sensory information coming in, um, some in multiple dimensions? Uh, and where do you, as a, as a human, place your attention when it might be an absolutely tiny fraction of the visual domain that needs to need your attention, such as that one image of a ghost? Um, how do you not how do you not correlate that with the bird that's currently tweeting outside and link those two together? Why is that not important? But your father or mother pointing to that and saying the word ghost is important. The, the, you know, we're nowhere near really understanding these questions. We have a, a, a glimpse of what might be involved, but we're right at the start of the journey. I think it's, it's fascinating to see how it all develops in the future. Yeah, um, it's a topic that fascinates me. We talk about it all the time. And um... I mean, first of all, there, there, there is a, a space of cognition. So there's many different ways of thinking. Mm -hmm. And the models that we've built clearly are doing thinking, right? They're, they're remarkable, mm -hmm. they're indistinguishable. But um, we speak about the Chinese room argument, and that's all about the resolution of understanding. Mm -hmm. So um, my mate, Mark Bishop, he gives this example of the guy in the room laughing. Mm -hmm. So he has this conscious experience. And, but, you know, even then, it's a joke. Mm. written in Chinese he mm. understands the joke so just understanding the joke GPT already does that mm. you can show GPT a meme mm -hmm. you know why is this picture weird oh it's weird because it's like a guy playing the piano on the back of a taxi yeah so GPT understood the joke but GPT didn't laugh exactly so does mm. that conscious experience mm. affect your understanding mm. Mark Bishop would, would say yes it does but yeah, the, the remarkable thing is we always thought, well, multimodality, it's going to change everything mm. when, when we've got different senses and so on. And we know this is true because when, you know, like Paris to me, I think of, I think of sipping the cappuccino in the brasserie <laughs> all the times I've been to Paris. But these models don't have that experience. Mm. They just have language mm. and they still have a remarkable, you know, in big air quotes, theory of mind. But why is that? Uh, do, do you care? Do you think it's important? I do think it's important. And I, I've read uh, as well articles that have said, and it's not just about laughing, but it's about laughing to oneself and not doing it for someone else. And I think this is what's missing from GPT and other large language models as well, um, or, or any sort of AI model that, that's, that's considered to be generative, is the idea that it, it has some sort of reason to do things. And it's not just doing things because it's been prompted, but there is some underlying prior that it has a an inclination to move towards and you know we're, we're starting to see sort of things that sort of try to try to push us towards this direction with the auto gpt and other mechanisms that allow goal oriented behavior but that's still different in my opinion there's nothing really there's no want about it it's just a it's doing what it's always been asked to do which is predict the next word so why does it feel different for us that, you know, a, a want or a desire or a, a fear or a hatred or a, um, or, or a, a misunderstanding of, our, of ours feels different than just producing text? Um, so whether we can use the same mechanisms to, to give the impression or mimic these emotions, I'm not sure, um, because I think that there's something it feels like th this isn't just a uh, a decoding problem as as gpt is solving but there needs to be something more inherent to these models that you know we're currently lacking um we we must remember that that gpt has one trick its trick is to predict the next word and i think you know when when people uh, you know i see on on twitter you know people talking about you know agi revolution and that we're these models are going to take over the world and that there's they're going to run away and they're going to start thinking for themselves I think we we must ground ourselves always in the fact that we've built a next word predictor, a very, very good one, 
but still that is what we've built and we need to always remember that there's no you know that, that we sh it's funny isn't it no sci-fi has been written about a, a an ai that can predict the next word that, that it's always an embodied ai or it's always and yet we're still talking about these models as th the thing we should fear and that it's going to cause the end of humanity so well, yeah let, let me let me push back on that tiny bit i mean i'm, I'm interviewing uh, robert miles next sunday he's like a big alignment agi guy yeah and um, I, I think at this stage, it is an over-trivialization to say that they're predicting the next word and they don't have a world model. Mm. And, um, you know, we are bred on this idea of emergence. Mm -hmm. So um, these alignment folks talk about orthogonality, mm -hmm. which is that even though we're training it to predict the next word, it has these instrumental goals which emerge. Mm. And there's an orthogonality between capability and perplexity. So, you know perplexity seems to go down in this nice exponential curve but suddenly you get these emergent capabilities mm -hmm. and um and also there's like intrinsic goals which emerge versus in something like auto gpt where i say i want you to make me a react app mm -hmm. i want it to have an internet connection i want it to do this and i want it to do that and then you get into this alignment problem which is what they talk about and yep. this is a real problem with G with auto gpt mm -hmm. um it's almost hilarious i don't know if you've seen some videos of it but you you get it to ask like what what gaming pc should i buy mm. and it goes into this infinite loop and yeah it says i need to go and do this and i need to go and do that and that's because like it, it's so brittle yeah so gpt is amazing when like i use it all the time to write yeah. software but i supervise it step by step mm -hmm. because i'm i'm constantly keeping it on guardrails and that's why I think people who are hyping auto GPT don't really know much about software engineering to be For sure. completely honest, but, but yeah, I mean, what, what do you think about this point though? Do you think, or do you agree that it's an over trivialization to say they're just predicting the next work? Well, I, so the point about world models that you make, I think is, is a important one to, to fix on for a little bit. I would say they don't have a, an explicit world model as in we haven't, we haven't built them to have a world model, but they seem to have developed one. That's, that's the critical point here. Um, and so I guess the point I'm making is that what if we do have we do build them to have an explicit world model and that goes back to Lacan's work on Jepa is that he would like these these uh, these models to have some for some form of explicit world model so that yes that large language model may form part of this solution that he's, he's building but I think his point is that he doesn't want them to just be large language models that we implicitly seem to have developed with a, a world model and I, I completely agree with you that you know they are doing some sort of reasoning they are doing some sort of um, world modeling, but in a way that they seem to have developed on their own. And I think in some ways that's actually a more powerful way of building a world model because we, do we really want to to force our understanding of what a world model might be onto these models or should we let them discover that for, for themselves? Um, so, so yeah, I think the world model point is an important one and it goes back to the, you know, David Haas 2018 work, World Models, which is in the book actually. Um, one of the reasons I, I wrote the book was that paper. I was fascinated by the idea that you could hallucinate, you know, environment and um, you could learn within that environment in a way that's just as powerful as the, the real one. And that the, the fact that there's a, a VAE variation autoencoder at the very heart of that is so critical to its, its power. And I think that, you know, we've seen five years of progression now and we're still talking about world modeling as being the future of generative AI, especially through people like Lickin. Could I push back on that a tiny bit? We, we interviewed um, David Ha. And uh, I, I think I remember that paper and, and um, there's some related work from Schmidt Huber as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, it's jointly uh, written, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I think even in that work, they were used, they were kind of taking actions on the um, the implicit representation space, but, mm -hmm. but also more broadly, even with Lacoon's work, if you have a neural network, like let's say it's a world model about what the environment would be if I took, you know, what would the state be if I took this next action? Like... Is that really a world model? It isn't that just as implicit as a language model. Mm. I've always sort of defined a world model as something that doesn't you don't you build without a particular task in mind. Um, you just want to understand how the world responds to certain inputs. So, yeah, the the link I guess is back to childhood imitation learning, where they are they are trying to trying to enact in the world responses that they can predict through their own world model and it goes back to i guess friston's work on active inference around what we're trying to do perhaps is just align our prior understanding of how the world behaves to our posterior and after an action is taken do we see what we think we're going to see and how powerful that idea is can that get us to, to further towards intelligent behavior so yeah i think in terms of world modeling i think 
the first thing I think you know, people who want to understand this is to, is to really have a, a tight definition in their mind of what a world model is. We know we're trying to build something here that is task independent. We're trying to build something that you can you can you can train without any particular um, any particular reward function. For example, re- reinforcement learning often you know there's a reward function that you you, you optimize towards. World modeling says no, just train yourself to to be, have a very very good understanding about how the world develops given your your actions. And again, Friston's work talks about action and perception as two sides of the same coin. And that actually perhaps our the way in which we observe and act in the world is all working towards the same objective function, which is to minimize free energy and to um, to try to to try to make sure our generative world model is as accurate as possible so that we can we can um, contemplate in our own minds how the future might look and therefore work towards goals. Um, I think there's a ton of things to unpack within these within these ideas that you know no no one theory of mind at the moment has it all correct and that I think they've probably all got things that we we need to as as generative AI practitioners take notice of and that we shouldn't just get obsessed by something like GPT and sort of treat it as the answer to everything. Interesting, yeah. Um, so I, I had a great chat with Friston recently, and um, as a refresher for folks, he's got this idea of a cybernetic loop and a cybernetic loop is basically what you just said it's just i have an agent and um, i take actions and i get percepts in and um, he really leans on this idea of there being a didactic exchange his his words not mine he he uses flowery language Um, but but this idea of of having this um, collective intelligence of agents that are demarcated by boundaries and they have this um cyclic causal dependency basically Mm -hmm. and you get this emergent self-organization and and interesting behavior but but he is an extreme empiricist like lacoon Mm -hmm. and what i guess what i'm saying with this world model is it's an implicit world model because um it's in it's empirical it's behavioral so you're you're just taking actions you're taking in percepts you're making observations Mm -hmm. and you're building an implicit world model and then there's the question of, well, what is the world model? And there's a, a really good, I'm, I'm blanking on the name of this board game, but there was a great paper out about a month or two ago where they got a language model to play a board game. Cicero? Um, was that the uh, diplomacy, perhaps? No. Oh, the different no, one. That, that was good as well. Yeah, that was good but, as well. <laughs> um, but they then they took the representation space of the language model and um, like using Tisney or something. Oh, and, yeah. and it had this topology, which mm. was clearly some kind of abstract representation of of the world model mm. not too dissimilar to what us humans would build because the, the key question is you know from an empiricism point of view is it possible to go from observational data to an abstract world model mm. yeah and I, I think it, it comes down to the question of what we consider an observation um you know our own actions are observations ultimately and that's where i think friston's work um incorporates this idea of action and percept being two sides of the same coin in that you know we have on our shoulders a head that has a has a way of viewing the world and that we can decide through action what observation we want to take in um so therefore we shouldn't just treat action as observation as two um completely separate concepts but perhaps we should say well you know our future observations are and therefore our future uh, successes are dependent on how we decide to act not just to achieve a goal but to maximize our information um input through moving this thing on our shoulders in the way that makes the information most valuable to us in the short and long term. Um, and I think there's this always been this trade-off, isn't it, in reinforcement learning between ox- exploitation and, and, and uh, exploration. And there have been, with RL, many uh, ways of tackling this, some more hard-coded than others, whether you have a small epsilon chance of taking an um, explorative action is the basic way to do it, but then you have other means of curiosity learning and so on and so forth that uh, that sort of embed into the model a, a reward for being curious, if you like. But they, they still ultimately are rewards. They're all reward-oriented methods. And I think what I've always been seeking, especially you know through researching this book and, and looking for in literature, is the idea that we can be reward-free because we seem as humans to be completely happy living in a world and being intelligent without any explicit rewards. Nature isn't so kind to us as to give us rewards for doing things that uh, we seem to enjoy and, 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 and want. We just have this mechanism of being able to, through some sort of self-supervised world model ultimately, tell you know whether something is in the future as we expect it to be or not. And if you boil it down to it, this is what Friston's idea is, I think, is that he's like, well, 
what do you expect us to do? What can we do if we have a Markov blanket around us? What do you expect a thing with a Markov blanket to do? And really, if you think about it hard, the only thing it can do is is get things right about its future. And that that's a fundamental idea, I think, that you know, even if you think of something like GPT, that is all it's doing. It's getting something right about its future. It's trying to be at one step ahead of, of itself all the time. Um, so I, I, I do hope that there's a collision of ideas from, you know, the, the generative AI that we're seeing today from OpenAI and, and other you know, large companies and the more niche area of active inference and Friston's work, because I, I you know, I do wonder if, if the same amount of money and time was poured into the concept of active inference, which I think has always been fascinating and an elegant way to describe intelligence, whether there is there is a lot of um, benefit of those two fields really understanding each other in great depth. And I wonder how many people in generative modeling uh, on the on the large language model side really understand active inference and also vice versa. I, I think there's some great, that Venn diagram space, the, the intersection of those two is going to be a really interesting area to explore going forward yeah i mean since we're on the, the subject of of friston so um yeah he's he's the main thing that he's solved is this kind of what is normally a dichotomy between exploration and exploitation so mm. he's got this beautiful formalism and he calls it energy and entropy mm -hmm. i think the, the the entropy is basically like a kind of kl divergence which is a way of comparing probability exactly yeah mm -hmm. but but the, the the idea is is that there's this existential imperative and, and you're kind of like um predicting the, the the likelihood of your existence if you take this trajectory of paths mm -hmm. and he compares that with what he thinks to be quite naive um value-based learning and reinforcement learning which is you know that you do um, something which is equivalent to maximum likelihood estimation through um, a value function, and um, and it gets to it gets to the heart of kind of goal based learning versus value based learning. But I mean, could, could you just sketch out exactly what is the difference between Friston's ideas and reinforcement learning, and w computationally perhaps why is it difficult to implement Friston's ideas? Mm. Well, uh, yeah. So let's start with reinforcement learning. I think the diagram that you see in just about every reinforcement learning book. Uh, summarizes it neatly which is that you have two considered separate entities the agent and the environment and there is no the two can be completely modular so that one doesn't depend on the other and what i mean by that is that there's this exchange of information that happens between them uh, the agent giving actions to the environment and the environment giving observations and rewards back to the agent and a done state which again is completely uh, if you think about it arbitrary i mean we don't have a done state in reality do we so already you're you're in problems with um considering reinforcement learning as the the real mechanism through which actual human learning takes place because reward done states i mean we don't have these things in reality we just get the stream of observations so active inference sort of treats it differently and it says well what if we just have the stream of observations and there is some prior distribution that we're looking to move towards um of our own internal you know, hidden latent representation and what we're going to try and do is do this via a non reward based mechanism so uh, the only reward is really be our own um, internal sort of perception of whether we're able to uh, how good our generative model is effectively and our generative model is just you know given things that i can do in the environment am i able to show what is going to happen in future um, and you know there's two ways of thinking about that you can either do it in the observation space itself and so compare a, a decoded observation if you like based on your own representation to the actual or you can do everything in latent space um, and you know something like uh, I guess it's the same difference I guess between the early diffusion models which are all um, you know, based in observation space and something like latent diffusion where the diffusion model actually happens within latent space and so, yeah, the, 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 two, the two really differ on the idea that um, the, the, the agent and the, the environment have this exchange of information on the reinforcement learning side via rewards and, and, and actions, and you end up trying to maximize a, 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 or minimize, in some cases, a loss function, and maximize reward or, or minimize um, a negative reward. And on the other side, on the active inference, you're always looking to, to optimize the generative model, and it ends up being that the generative model itself is the the be all and end all of the the existence and that you know the markov blanket is only intact if the generative model stays good and so as soon as you destroy the markov blanket you destroy your your existence and you're no longer an interesting entity within that environment um and yeah i think that's a, a beautiful idea 
and I, I just uh, I'm, I'm very honoured actually that Carl Briston's um, uh, provided a foreword to the new edition of the book. He's an absolute hero of mine. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing how the two fields overlap in future. Yeah, yeah. Um, Friston is absolutely amazing. And, um, you know, I run the show with Keith and Friston is Keith's favourite. <laughs> but the, the, the thing is, um, in an ideal world, we would all be Bayesians, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it works so well. And we'll, we'll talk about, by the way, the, the divergence between traditional data science and what we're doing now with, with the big stuff. But... Um, it's 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 one of the main um, tools in the box as a data scientist to be doing Bayesian optimization or Gaussian processes, mm -hmm. and you know it's because it gives you this beautifully principled way of knowing about areas of uncertainty and knowing where you need to explore and mm -hmm. Kristen combine those together in, mm -hmm. into a um, you know in, into a single formalism, but. Um, we live in a world which is very complicated, mm. right? So we can't possibly, I mean, it, there is no such thing as a probability distribution over everything. Mm -hmm. Lacoon took the move of, of inventing these energy-based models, but is it not a significant restriction to implementing um, Friston's ideas as well? Yeah, I, I think that's always been the challenge with active inference is that it's found difficulty in actual application to a specific complex problem. So toy examples are, you know, are very important to demonstrate the concept, but I think where other kinds of modeling such as uh, the GPT models have succeeded is that they've been trained on huge amounts of data and they're able to solve very complex problems. Now, that's not to say that the idea is, the active inference idea is 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 incapable, but I would say, uh, it, you know, it needs real attention in order to, in order to, to map these same ideas onto something more complex. Um, I, I mean, I, I would love to know I don't have a huge amount of information on what is happening in active inference right now, but I imagine this is one of the key problems that is being looked at, is how do you map these ideas, which are so elegant and so beautiful, to something that actually has practical application and isn't just takes it beyond. I mean, you have to remember as well, the same thing was true of a lot of the uh, the early, you know, what we consider neural ne network architectures now that are cutting edge, in that, you know, they could be worked on on toy examples, but people would say, yeah, but, you know, they can't just take in the entire web and learn how to predict into the future. Well, they can, you know, they just needed a huge amount of investment from a few key companies. So I don't think there's anything in principle stopping the same ideas being applied, active inference ideas being applied at scale, but it needs needs attention. You know, it needs, um, attention is probably the wrong word there to, uh, I mean that in a, in a non-technical sense rather than a transformer sense, but uh, well, who knows, maybe it does need a attention in a transformer sense as well. But yeah, we, we, we just need, I guess, I, I guess I'd what I'd love to see is that there's a, um, a real push towards combining these ideas. Cause I think they've both got things to say and quite different things to say in many, many cases, but that there is overlap and that some of the ideas from active inference can start bleeding through into transformers and, and, and GPT style models. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's an interesting area to sort of see develop, I think. It is, yeah. And, and we're speaking with Maxwell Ramster in, in a few weeks. He's really um, like a big pillar in that community. But yeah, um, I was trying to get to the bottom of this with Friston because it's, um, you, you can you can use the model uh, as, a, as a simulator or as a, you know, a simulacrum, mm. which basically means that I can simulate the world and even then i could start from the lowest possible like you know the highest resolution which isn't really going to work so usually you have to you have to select a level of coarseness that you're going to start from mm. um just to reduce the size of, of the problem so you might predefine the agents and the boundaries and you might reduce the size of of the um approximation space in in some way um or you can just use it as a lens to understand the world as it is that's mm -hmm. the, the simulacra and um it's 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 actually quite brittle in both cases to get any friction with the real world mm -hmm. right? because i've built this ai simulation well how do i actually usefully use that in the real world or i'm using it as a lens to understand you know like um collective intelligence and emergence dynamics in twitter and society how do i use that in the mm -hmm. real world so it's a similar thing with um you know the using simulators and reinforcement learning there's not much friction with the real world so i think that's the main challenge that they need to overcome yeah I, another area i think to touch on as well is the idea of uh there being multiple agents in the same environment where no one agent has all the information but they have a mechanism to share information between agents and i suppose with you know with with things like gpt they all only really care and they have been trained to care about their own you know, one interpretation of this data set. There is only one GPT-4 model, but it's interesting to think how, you know, as a human, 
I mean, just a thought experiment. If there is only one human in existence with the same that was born, how much could they really learn if it was just them? Do they need other humans with other experiences in order to develop to a, the highest levels of intelligence that we're, you know, we see around us? Um, I, I don't know whether that idea is something that is going to also bleed into uh, into into this sort of transformer and and um, you know decoder transformer style uh, AI. I don't know whether you know they will start talking to each other and therefore learning information from them, and that we won't have try to build one super intelligence that has seen everything and can reason about everything. But well, what about if there were smaller models trained on smaller data sets where? they are able to develop an extraordinarily high level of understanding about their field and that they have the mechanism to engage with other agents that have done the same thing about other data sets and that that is how, as a superset, we develop mm -hmm. intelligence and that no one of them on their own is able to, 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 to say, yes, I am the super intelligence. I mean, I think that's an interesting area as well, isn't it, that we might sort of see proliferate is that the idea that we might have a an... Um, on top of that uh, strata of human existence, there may be an undercurrent of AI models all also speaking to each other and, and engaging with in, uh, and, and um, engaging with each other and delivering information between each other and also bet between strata, so to us and from us. Um, and I think I wonder if that's one of the areas that we might start to see developing is that we don't just have one company trying to build one model to understand everything, but there are there are different models that have different specialties. And that there is some sort of interface between them, probably natural language through which they can share and and want. And this is where the wanting comes in. They need to want to to share information. Now, how do you embed that? Um, you know, because this is this is at the point of inference. Remember, this isn't. We can't train them further. At, you know, once they're out in the wild, they have to. This want has to come from some sort of internal internal uh, function. And so why should they want to care to talk to this GPT model rather than this GPT model over here? So yeah, I, I, I'm just thinking out now, out loud now, sort of how that might happen. I don't know, fascinating though, isn't it? Like, well, yeah. why don't we do that? What, well, th that's exactly what Ben Goetzel has been advocating for years with his mm. Singularity Net. And we interviewed him at the time. And the, the problem is um, not only relevance and the, the interface is a problem because you have the semantics problem. Mm -hmm. um, it's very, very brittle. It's very, very difficult to have a specification of an API that can be dynamically discovered and, and consumed mm -hmm. by others. But then there's also some kind of a reputation system. You mm -hmm. know, I might want to consume this API over another mm -hmm. API. And in principle, I think it's a really good idea because I love this idea of collective intelligence and decentralized intelligence. I don't want to have one single monolithic model. But by the same token, when you start talking about hybrid architectures, it introduces a form of brittleness. I mean, the, the main reason why neural networks aren't brittle is because they do end-to-end -end learning, mm. um, which overcame a lot of the brittleness of traditional software engineering, where you have all of these modules with interfaces and, and so on. But um, but that was exactly what Ramsted and Friston kind of spoke about in, in their recent paper, which is this idea of an intelligence 3.0, this mm -hmm. new society of, of kind of like intelligent agents that, that have these um, didactic exchanges, again, mm. to use his language. But um, there are a couple of issues that come up in my mind, and I asked Briston about this, which is to say, like, um, if you did have such an um, like a nebulous, amorphous domain of intelligence, and first of all, society is already like that, right? So we already have the infosphere. Mm -hmm. um, no, nobody understands how it works. It's kind of diffused, and lots of agents and mm. systems that are interconnected. But increasingly, a lot of those agents will themselves be more intelligent than they are now. And from a kind of regulatory point of view, an ethics point of view, how do we apply pressures? Mm. Um, we can't predict the future because of those exponential trajectories. But, you know, some people might say, well, we need to apply these pressures to kind of stop bad things from happening in the future. I mean, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a really, a really um, important subject, but also one that's incredibly nuanced, I think, the ethical side of things. Because on the one hand, I can completely understand why you know, people would be would be concerned that we don't seem to have any sort of regulation or, or body that oversees the development of AI models in the same way that we do with, um, I mean, it's been talked about, for example, nuclear energy or, or nuclear physics. Um, so, you know, how do we ensure that what we're building isn't actually incredibly destructive? But on the other hand, I think in order to make sure that the regulation is as tight as possible, we need to stay on top of you know what these models are doing and that requires research and it requires us not to pause as that the letter obviously was advocating for 
Um, so I think in terms of ethics, I, what I would like to see is that there is a certain amount of openness about data. Um, I think data is really, really critical to to understand what we're training the models on and also to, for example, for somebody to be able to to understand if, if a particular piece of data is within a model or without or, or not within a model. Uh, and I can understand why companies want to make you know, keep this information private. Um, but ultimately, you know, we are the models are a f reflection of the data they're trained on. So we can't really just shun that responsibility of saying, well, you know, it's it's private and it's hidden. So, you know, you, it is as it is. I mean, we you can't say the same thing about food that we eat. We want to know what's in it. And I, you know, I, I wonder if we, there's a parallel there to be drawn about, you know, it's not about sort of saying exactly how something was made or saying something exactly the process, but at least that you have to understand what it is we're consuming. Um, and I, I always, I, I like to see AI as a tool. I don't like to see it as a source. And I think sometimes people, you know, when they're talking about AI, they sort of, they say, oh, well, you need to quote the source as, as chat GPT. And I, I really don't like that because it assumes that the, it starts giving some, some, some credence to that particular entity and saying that this, this, the source of the information is chat GPT. And it, it's not, the source of the information is, is ultimately the data that it's trained on, albeit diffused and combined in a myriad of different ways that we could never possibly begin to understand into what we see as the, the creation. And it's the AI is the tool through which that happens. It's not the, 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 the end point of the information, if you like. And so I think ethically we need to sort of, that's how we need to treat AI. And it, we always need to give the, we need to, we need to give people the understanding that when they're using this, that ultimately what it is being, what it's showing us is a reflection of our own existence in the data that it's been trained on. Um, now, how we do that from a regulatory perspective, I don't know. I mean, that's a, uh, yeah, I think it starts questioning the very axioms of our own societal norms. And, you know, one axiom is that we, you can't create quantity, the quantity that we're seeing of text at this sort of scale. I think that's sort of something that a lot of our legal system is based around. And also our education system is based around the fact that you can't, you can't just generate an essay. And so it's, it, it's, it's knocked one of these axioms completely for six because now things like copyright law are based on the principle of the fact that to generate somebody's content, you need to have put real effort and time in to do so. And, and that the idea of copying something, you know, just, um, or even making very small minor tweaks to it and not putting your you know, sweat of the brow into it, if you like, is considered a, a, a um, yeah, it is going to be something that you can't do because, you know, ultimately that's not showing any any transformational process over the work. Um, but, you know, now that we have AI systems that can produce the quantity and the scale that we're seeing, that is, that's calling into question this axiom. And we need, it's not just a tweak to the system. I think we need completely to overhaul the way that we see things like copyright. And there's been so many cases of this recently, in music, arts, literature, um, and the reason we can't answer these questions quickly is because I don't think it's a quick fix. I think it's probably something we need to think very seriously about and that the courts will need to decide how to handle. Yeah. Um, so copyright currently hangs on effort and skill. Exactly. Things that have been greatly diminished. Precisely. By, like, yeah. yeah done mm -hmm. By these generative models. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I wanted to push back a tiny bit on the, um, I mean, I agree with the anthropomorphization and, mm. and the uh, the autonomy piece, though, which is that when I'm using a model interactively, I kind of agree with you intuitively that um, I'm guiding the process mm -hmm. and it's still my creation. Um, even with GPT-4, I mean, you know, I'm, I wrote a React app over the weekend mm. and it was a very iterative process. And when I'm iterating, I've actually got this mental model in my mind. There's a kind of tree structure mm -hmm. and I'm kind of traversing the tree and then it, it generates something I don't want. I go one step up the tree, I go in, you know, so yeah. I'm, I'm guiding the process. And the more you guide the process, I think it's a spectrum, like the more you have the right to say that it's yours. But I think we should accept that these models are going to be running autonomously mm -hmm. and... Um, how they behave will will be very complex because they'll be consumed by different people mm. with situated knowledge with different um i don't know in in a different environment basically and it'll just produce this very kind of complex array of of effects on society and then it gets to the point you were saying about whether the model should reflect 
the world as it is or as we want mm. and even humans are interesting because we might just be naive prediction machines but we also have these emergent like planes of morality for mm. example so we all kind of think that okay well this is the way things are that i actually think it should be different and this is the way i behave but internally i have a model which is slightly different to mm -hmm. what i you know give out um, externally so um yeah like do you do you think that we should model reality as it is or do you think we should apply pressure yeah i mean i think so the, the alignment problem is something i think um you know sam altman was saying the other day that it's it's just it's just not solved and it's a it's a major issue i think for the you know open ai if they're going to be in the future kind of you know seen to be the the leaders of this field it's something that they need to solve or at least they need to show that there are there are steps being taken towards such a solution um i think it, you know it's really interesting to you know if we think about where the problem lies here if it's just as a, a thought experiment imagine we had exactly the same technology that we have today but it took instead of seconds to generate text or images if we were talking about you know the process of months and 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 the, the the velocity of these models was so much slower you know would we be seeing them as so much of a threat and would we be so worried about their alignment to moral values i think the thing that scares people is the speed and the vo and the volume and it's not necessarily whether it's possible it's the fact that it's possible at speed and at scale um and i think we need to really be careful here especially when we're you know, talking about legislation that it's not the the, the fact that it's possible it's the problem it seems to be it's the fact that it's possible um to anybody and at scale and at volume and so yeah I, th I think when people you know when they were talking about the pause and the letter and and you know what people were really saying is that we need to we need to worry about how how quickly the model is able to produce content and produce things like disinformation rather than the fact that it's able to do it at all um and so it would be a shame to see you know legislation sort of ban or in some way regulate the the model itself because the model itself isn't really the problem i think it's the way in which it's dressed up and packaged um and so yeah i, I do wonder if we need to really understand the nuances of the problem rather than sort of just say well all ai all ai models that produce text you know are, are, should be should be banned because obviously we've had these models for a long time and it's only now that we're seeing this this sort of proliferation of speed and, and scale that it started to become an issue. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think it's really important to sort of note that it's the it's it's the velocity and the volume that's the problem, not the the fact that it's possible at all. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, I, I had a wonderful discussion with Luciano Floridi from the Oxford um, Internet Institute, and yeah, he said the same thing. You know, what's really different now is the scale, yeah, the velocity. But even then you could push back and say, well, um, being able to generate this stuff at scale is not the same as being able to distribute it at mm. that scale. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of on the fence a little bit, but he gave this wonderful quote, which is that, you know, like drop after drop after drop and 18 years later, you know, the drop mm. kind of shapes the, the, the drop sh shapes the rock basically. And, um, these these models will have pernicious effects, right? Over the, over the next 20 years or so, they're, they're going to steer society and, you could just argue, well, um, first of all, you can't really regulate it. You can't regulate no. language models because this technology is in the hands of everyone. Exactly. Yeah. Although it is interesting that OpenAI, for some reason, maybe you've got some intuition on this, their models are significantly better than everybody else's. Mm -hmm. when, I'm, when I'm using language models, mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, I only use GPT-4. And yeah. We'll talk about some of the, the minor differences. But, um, but pretty soon, this technology will be democratized every government's going to create their own one mm. loads of companies are creating them at the moment so you can't really stop it right no absolutely and, and you're right it's in the it's in the open source community now so as soon as that you know the technology is out there and and in in, in the key the, the important thing to note about that is that it's the fact that the technology itself isn't complex it's not like we're talking about you know building a nuclear reactor where it's not anyone can do this to be completely honest the technology that drives gpt4 well gpt3 at least we don't know gpt4 because they haven't really talked about it very publicly but certainly gpt3 we're talking about you know just matrix multiplication <laughs> like there's nothing more to it than than that um and it, you know we, even to that extent it, we're talking about matrix multiplication where there's no recurrence there's no convolution the attention mechanism is remarkably simple and it's amazing actually it wasn't discovered before things like lstms because they are lstms are by far more complicated to learn about and to understand 
you know, attention is a very simple principle that I think the, and this is why we're seeing lots of replica models now, is that really what you, you, what you were talking about is can you, can you scale up the compute and can you, have you got enough data? And even then there's the pile, there's different data sets out there that are open to public consumption. So what you're talking about really is have you got the, um, can you hire, the, can you build the right team in order to build the structures for these models? And do you have the, the ability to pay for this huge amount of compute? And, you know, that's coming down all the time as well. So you're absolutely right that the, this is becoming democratized as a technology. It's not a nuclear reactor we're building. We're building something that ultimately is, um, it's, it's compute at the end of the day. And, and I, I know Sam Altman talked about the fact that GPT-4's improvements are actually hundreds of minor improvements rather than a significant technological leap. And so I think, you know, why is it so much better than the other models? I think they've got extraordinarily smart people working for them at OpenAI. And I do think that, you know, I, I would believe him when he says that it's a, a lot of minor improvements rather than a sort of major change that they've made to the model architecture. Um, but is it bigger? Yeah, probably I would imagine so, but I don't know. Um, I guess, yeah, you'd have to talk to someone on the inside at OpenAI. But it, it's interesting to know that you can make the significant improvements through minor changes rather than some sort of major technological improvement. Yeah, I mean, there's a few things we can talk about. We can talk about in, um, attention in general, and there's actually a really interesting um, new paper out which managed managed to scale it up to two million tokens yep. by mm. um, using an RNN with you know like the the, the actual nodes were attention mm. blocks, and then like you know being able to share information through a meta RNN on on top. Um, so yeah, there, there, there's the question of what happens when we when we have longer um, attention lengths, and I'm, I'm not actually convinced it's a foregone conclusion that longer attention lengths mm. means better at reasoning and better at various different um, things. But um, yeah, so um, first of all, the differences between uh, the GPT models. So even GPT 3.5, we suspect that it must be a tiny model because for them to deploy it at scale, mm -hmm. it's probably like around two billion parameters. I think people have estimated. Mm -hmm. And and then I agree with you. It's probably just a very basic instruct model. So it's like a traditional self attention autoregressive transformer mm -hmm. that's been um, fine tuned with some kind of like you know, let's say RLHF or something. And probably the secret source is the the data that they've trained it on and the human fine tuning. Mm -hmm. Now. It's really, really good. And I think GPT 3.5 is actually better than Codex because if you read the Sparks of AI paper, mm -hmm. they didn't include GPT 3.5 because I think the reason was it was actually better than mm. their Codex model. Mm -hmm. But then the reason why people don't use GPT 3.5 for coding is because it's got a context size of 4K, which mm. is basically useless. Yep. Having a context size of, of 8K is, is good enough for a lot of things. Mm -hmm. 32 would be even better. Yep. But then... Building and deploying a model with a context size of 32K is basically impossible unless you're open AI. So do you think that'll be a blocker for a long time? Yeah, and I, well, I think this comes back to the idea of, you know, as humans, we seem to be able to compress information from our distant past into something that we can retrieve quickly at inference time. Um, we don't seem to store in memory a context of our entire existence. What we seem to be doing is packaging up information into small units that we can call upon at inference time. So, uh, yes, I agree there seems to be some need for a context window of a certain size, otherwise you, your short-term memory is, is, is severely impaired. Um, but, you know, how do we, and I think this is where the, the vector database thing is an interesting idea, how do we embed long contextual information that isn't just using the attention mechanism? Or maybe that attention mechanism can be used at a higher hierarchical level so that the units over which attention is operating aren't tokens and words anymore, but they are concepts and ideas and embeddings um, in, a, in a higher sort of hierarchical latent space. So, um, I, yeah, I think, I think that's one interesting idea uh, to explore. But also the, the idea there that you mentioned that, you know, yeah, GPT 3.5 is, is as good, if not better than the coding model, I think is, yeah, just speaks to the idea that um, the, yeah, the, the ability for these models to understand in detail a range of different topics is remarkable and they don't need to be necessarily trained on a single uh, corpus of text. They can sort of maybe chat, you know, GPT 3.5 is using some information from actual natural language text in order to help its coding ability. Mm -hmm. And I've read, I've read um, as well that, that that goes the other way and that logic is in some ways uh, is, is improved within these models if they are trained on code, 
because code is ultimately our human expression of logic in text form. And so if you train a large language model on a, a huge amount of coding information, such as you know, the GitHub database, then you actually generate a language model that is able to reason a lot more effectively. And so, I, yeah, I think that's, a, that's an incredible idea that you can, <laughs> it can yeah. sort of move information from our sort of messy, noisy uh, corpus of, of text that is not coding into something that is, or, or, that is coding into something that is ultimately, you know, all about logical reasoning, but in, in the space of natural language. Yeah, exactly. And they've, I mean, Microsoft basically owns OpenAI at this point, and they've given them access to all of the code on GitHub. And actually, a lot of providers are now just cottoning on that they shouldn't be giving their data away. So I think, you know, Stack Overflow and mm -hmm. Reddit and um, Elon Musk with Twitter, for example. So in a way, GPT-4 might be the best we ever see. I mean, I, I actually believe that GPT-4 might be at the limit of what's possible with this mm -hmm. paradigm anyway. Although I will get you to answer your intuition on does it go without saying that a longer context size is better? Like I've not played with the 32K model. I don't know if they're still using like cross attention. Mm. I don't know whether it's as good as the 8K model and it's not a foregone conclusion that a longer context size is better. I mean, why don't we just do that one first? Yeah, so briefly, uh, context window, just, just to kind of cover off what, what we mean by this is how far back in the past a model can attend to. And unlike a recurrent neural network where if information is further in the past, it is more likely to be diluted because it's currently, it's having to update its hidden state continuously in sequence as it runs through the text. Attention treats all previous tokens as equal and it can decide where it wants to focus its attention. So even if something was the 29,999th token, that has as much potential to be brought forward into the current context as the previous token. Um, so it treats them all as equal and it has the ability to say, I want to draw attention to this word here and then maybe you know, thousands of words in the future, this particular word. And it will pull those through, through layers of multi-head attention layers um, to ultimately give a, a probabilistic prediction of the next word. Um, so what does a larger context window give you? Well, quite simply, it only gives you the ability to attend to something that is further back in time. And so to your point there around you know, what, what do we need longer context windows? And is that the answer? Well, I think it's only the answer if you build, if you only build models that are decoder transformers that don't involve any memory. As soon as you start talking about memory and finding ways to embed um, <clears throat> packets of information from the distant past, then the context window doesn't become so important. And you think about all of our conversations so far, how far does 32,000 tokens get, get us back? Well, probably from the start of our conversation, I'm not remembering exactly what's been said word for word. I've just got a broad understanding of our introduction and I've, I've, my brain seems to have packaged that up into a unit that I could probably tell you roughly what we talked about, but I can't tell you the exact sentence. Um, and obviously biologically we're limited by the, um, the lump of matter that's in our heads and there's a spatial restriction and a weight restriction, which you don't necessarily have with, with, um, silicon. Um, but, you know, we do have restrictions in terms of inference time and the larger the models get, the slower they become, like you, you rightly said. And so if we're going to practically build these things to be useful to people, we do have uh, constraints on size. And just like, our, you know, our brains where the constraint is, is the fact that we need to carry it around on our heads. Um, the constraint with large language models is slightly different. It's not necessarily a, a weight consideration, obviously, but it's a it's a speed consideration that we need to have. So I, I think you're right that that GPT-4 we might be seeing as the the limit of what we can do with this context window size, perhaps. But there will be now other technologies that need to be developed alongside the decoder style transformer that enable us to pull information from the distant past. And vector databases, I think, are one exciting technology that we're seeing do this. But even that. The way uh, you know an embedding effectively works is it's going to chunk up information into say 150 token chunks, and each of those chunks gets embedded into um, a, a, a vector, and those vectors are then compared to the current context window vector to say which one do you think is the closest. And in many cases, we're talking about things like cosine similarity, so fairly rudimentary ways of comparing vectors with each other. Um, but you know, the, I think you know there's going to be technological improvements in how we do that look back um <clears throat> one way that you know we've just talked about on, on this call is can we apply the attention mechanism not to words but to concepts and perhaps you know we <clears throat> we have into our past a sort of hierarchical understanding of you know could i could i summarize in a year all of my experience and that's one token and 
<clears throat> maybe I want to pull just that one token, the year's worth of existence token into my current context window to tell you about something that happened 10 years ago. I'm not going to go back and look at every single word, but my brain seems to have embedded that into some space that I can retrieve quickly. Um, and that's going to be a lot less detailed than something from a week in the past than a day in the past. And they may have their own way of being embedded. Um, but ultimately, all of the attention mechanisms that are used by GPT-4 are at the token level. As far as we understand, we obviously don't know, but um, you know, we understand that the context window is all is all based around tokens and that we haven't got the ability to, at the moment, sort of pull in a token from 10 years ago um, at, a higher, at a higher level of abstraction. Um, so I would love to see research in that. I haven't actually seen any sort of talking about things that way, but yeah, just through this conversation with, I mean, it's an interesting idea, I think, right? That we can yeah. apply attention to uh, different hierarchies. And it, it's similar to Friston's idea that, you know, active inference can be applied at different hierarchical levels of existence, the, the, the organism itself, but also down to the cellular level. And there's Markov blankets around each of these units. Well, maybe we have the ability in the future to divide up um, historical experience into chunks that we tokenize and that we talk about as something can be embedded in its own right and that future decoder models won't just be operating at one level but they have the ability to spread across multiple levels of hierarchy i think that's an exciting area of research yeah yeah i'm, I'm similarly very excited about a, a hierarchical approach um as we just said there's there's currently this recurrent approach which mm -hmm. infuses information through time but as we know rnns forget things quite quickly um, but yeah, like there's something really, really exciting about large language models as they are at the moment because they're so simple and they're very high resolution. So mm. everything that's in your context, um, it can attend to on a token by token basis. But the reason why I think it's not a foregone conclusion that a longer context size is better is because um, we have a strong locality prior. Mm -hmm. Most machine learning priors are locality priors. It's the way we think. And just think about it, if, you, if you're training a model with 100K context, all of the long range dependencies will be so sparse as to have basically zero gradient mm -hmm. because there's exponentially more crap in the future. Like the further the further horizon, the horizon goes, the more crap there is. Mm -hmm. um, and also it becomes relevant how you train it because let's say I'm training on all the data on GitHub. Mm -hmm. Well, um, the order in which I give the information to GPT might be relevant because, you know, presumably yeah. I would still cluster all of the code files that are from a particular repo. And then you get into this notion of, okay, well, I could move away from just showing it tokens and actually explicitly saying this is a file. Mm -hmm. And then you made the move of doing um, retrieval augmented generation and vector search. But in my experience, retrieval augmented generation isn't that good. Mm. And that's partially because you lose the beauty of language models, which is that they have this like very rich semantic map and understanding at a high resolution. When you start doing a cosine similarity on, on a vector and then pulling random bits of information. And in. I mean, like a lot of these search engines like Bing that do this at the moment. I mean, frankly, I, I prefer using raw GPT than Bing because it exactly. gives me a load of crap. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I think you're right, though, that, you know, the, the way when we're talking about vector lookup in this works is that the, the chunk itself will, um, will, will capture it via its embedding a certain... Uh, a certain flavor of what that paragraph was about. But the problem with that is that the same paragraph might have many different applications into your current context. So that embedding loses a certain amount of information that you, and you don't have that problem exactly like you said with, um, with GPT style models, because it, the very definition of attention is that it can decide where it wants to attend to. And, you know, if you take, um, as an example in the book of um, you know, the pink elephant wanted to get into the car, but it was too, well, obviously we're thinking big because it's an elephant and it's a car and he wants it to get in. The word pink has no relevance there as it's no, there's no contextual benefit in attention to it. But as soon as we say, you know, the pink elephant wanted to, um, wanted to hide, then the very fact that it's colored pink is going to be a, a problem because it's very visible in the environment. And so suddenly that word becomes relevant. And we, you know, if we, if we if we were trying to embed this whole paragraph or this 150 words into an embedding, well, we're back to the old LSTM problem of how much how much weight or how much importance within the embedding do you want to give the word pink? And it depends on the context. So yeah, while vector databases are one way to solve this problem, I think what I'd love to see is, you know, this idea that 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 perhaps you know, concepts and, and and chunks from the past 
are how can we how can we almost create maybe multiple embeddings of the same of the same idea or create the embedding somehow on the fly to to capture you know what we want it to do in this current context um yeah i don't think it's an easy thing to solve but that's uh, that's where we might have to get to okay so how should schools and universities prepare for the advent of generative ai yeah i mean i, I used to be a maths teacher so I, I i have good memories of you know teaching classrooms full of children and um i i do worry these days about what the implication of these technologies are going to be because i don't think i don't think the sector is ready and i, I mean that in the sense of you know speaking with teachers and speaking with people in in the sector i get the feeling of um that the fact that children have the ability to access this technology now is not something that's particularly front and foremost of of people's minds and you know we're seeing it at university level as well where people are submitting essays through chat gpt and there's huge questions that need answering whether it should be allowed whether it should be something that's encouraged because it actually allows children and, and students to generate more original and perhaps go to areas uh, of, of, of thought that they wouldn't have previously gone to um or you know do we do we say actually these technologies are taking away the ability for students to think independently and how do we what does education mean you know what's the definition of education and i think you know if we look back what, what the precedent for this is when you think of the, the invention of the calculator or the internet itself these were always technologies that were worried about as a, as a potential threat to the definition of education and i think you know we've moved now from a a, a time when rote learning and memorization was considered the absolute pinnacle of somebody's intelligence through to creative thought and synthesis of ideas being more important and what we're seeing now is that even that is under threat the very synthesis of ideas from across domains is something that ai can do and not just assist with but complete so i think what education needs to do is have a look at itself and ask what do we what what, what do we need to do in order to ensure that the definition that we of education we want to take into the future is one that is aligned with the technological capabilities of the age of the era but also is one that is going to prepare students for the future um and their you know their working life yeah i think i think you nailed it so i would say education is about helping kids understand as you say at an abstract level not just memorization um fostering kind of creativity and having an inquiring mind mm. now chomsky said that language models make you lazy now i'm really torn on this because language models have helped me cover more ground mm -hmm. and learn more stuff than i would have done mm. but they've changed how I how I do things right so I'm spending less attention on things which are schematic and yep. you know kind of quite easy to automate and I'm I'm kind of spending more attention focusing and learning and exploring things that I wouldn't otherwise have done mm -hmm. but maybe I'm different do, do you think that they're going to make kids lazy I, well I, I'm exactly like you and I, it's, it's absolutely for sure improved how I work I mean I, I don't feel lazier as a result of it I feel more productive now the question is if we'd have had this when we were at school would we be in the position now to be saying that or would we be more lazy and less productive and i think what's important is to, to realize a colleague of mine said to me the other day the the problem we can't just say we'll give it to all students because it's going to make them more productive because look at us we're productive we've remembered a world where we've had to sit down with a blank sheet of paper and write that essay and so we've, I feel like because we've been through that process, we can take this for, we can use this technology to its absolute maximum potential and not, not use it as a crutch. Um, and, you know, like you said earlier about the, the tree of going back, revising, updating the prompt, maybe adding a bit of your own code in, putting that back into chat GPT. These are all skills we learned because we were there with that, that pencil in front of a, our essay written probably by hand. Um, putting lines through it, crossing that bit out, moving this paragraph down, and then later with word processors doing exactly the same thing. And the problem I think with giving children just carte blanche access to this sort of technology is that they haven't developed the abstract skills like you said up front to be able to be self-critical, to be able to edit, revise, cut back words where you know we're being too wordy, add words where more more is needed. And instead, uh, they there is a huge danger of 
we end up just being um, users of one particular tool and not really having control over what's being generated. So having said that, that's one side of my, my, my brain is thinking, you know, we really need to be careful with using this in the classroom. Having said that, children will be moving into a world where every day they're going to be using this technology. It will be embedded into Microsoft Word. It will be in their messaging apps. It will be um, the web itself will be driven through largely language based search, I think. And so we need to prepare them for that. And so you can't just say, well, you know, here's your word processor and we're going to disable all of these when I mean, we don't disable spell checking, for example. So, yeah, we, we've got to do it in a way, I think, that sort of and like we do with the Internet, you know, just remind students that there are two ways of thinking. Uh, one way is on the spot, critical uh, thought, which you don't have that crutch of technology around you in order to come up with ideas. Um, and then another way, which is perhaps in the same way that we encourage students to use the Internet for coursework, which is longer term um, you know, use everything available to you to, to produce the most incredible piece of work. Um, and that doesn't just mean putting it into chat GPT, but it means using it as one tool in your arsenal of different techniques and, 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 uh, uh, and tools to, to produce the best of the piece of work that truly reflects your opinion or truly reflects your beliefs. And there's a few steps that we can take. I think, you know, things like written essays being submitted might end up being a thing of the past and there will have to be some sort of viva that goes alongside it. Very small thing that we can do to make, make this a less of a problem immediately. Um, and like we do with universities, you don't just submit your PhD, you have to defend it and you have to answer difficult in-depth questions mm. that back up your your point of view. Um, and I, I think it's a great skill anyway. I mean, even if chat GPT didn't exist, why don't we do this now with written essays? Um, but then also I think we need to talk about, there's a body in the UK called um, uh, the JCQ, I think, uh, which is a body that oversees all examinations and, and um, the examin examining boards and explains to them how they should handle things like plagiarism or tries to come up with a, a, a sort of consolidated list of uh, approaches. And they've really recently released some uh, advice on AI and you know, how we should be t teaching students uh, about these technologies. Um, and having read it, I, I feel that the spirit of it is, is right, but I think some of the points in the execution are questionable. Um, they sort of talk about AI as something that needs referencing. So if you've, if you, for example, used as a student ChatGPT to generate your part of your essay, or indeed to use it to structure it, you need to say on your list of references that ChatGPT is a reference, you know, like square brackets five ChatGPT. For me, that's ludicrous because first of all, as I said earlier, we shouldn't be treating AI as the source. Mm -hmm. AI is a tool. We don't we don't quote Grammarly when we've used that to help our, our phrasing or our spelling, and I and I think it's a it's anthropomorphizing uh, uh, you know making human I guess if I can say the word anthropomorphizing um, the the fact that this is a a, a a separate entity that we now need to reference like we would do any other human and that's hugely dangerous. I mean we shouldn't be teaching children that at all. Um, and also there's a huge amount of ambiguity around that idea. So for example. Let's say you are uh, a student with dyslexia and a blank sheet of pay paper in front of you is is just your idea of an absolute nightmare. Getting those initial ideas down on paper is, is hugely challenging. Now, why shouldn't they be able to use chat GPT or any other mechanism using AI to structure their ideas and to produce a work that's of the best quality that they can produce? There's nothing in the guidance in the JCQ around helping students with these kind of problems to use AI to their advantage. They almost treat it like it's the enemy, which I, again, I think is really worrying. Um, and it reminds me of, you know, early days of the internet where we were sort of saying, we need to keep children away from, um, away from this because, you know, they won't be able to have any ideas of their own. They'll end up just reading something online and sort of paraphrasing it in their, their essays. But now, you know, we, it's a really important part of children's education is for them to be able to critically read a body, a body of information from a variety of sources and pull out the bits that they need. You know, why can't we talk about AI in the same regard? I, I saw you the other day, you know, speaking on the podcast saying, perfectly capable of reading something from GPT and, and not taking it at face value. Why why do we assume that children won't be able to do the same? And you know, there's this worry that they'll be sort of just cut and pasting large amounts of information out of these tools without really understanding it. But if, if we teach children, you know, this is a new tool that's available to us now, it's incredible. 
but you've got to use it in the right way. Otherwise, you know, you're not you're not educating yourself to the best of your ability. I think children are perfectly capable of understanding that message. Um, we just need to trust them and give them the, the, the right skills to, to use that. I mean, to push back on that a tiny bit, and, and I know this is basically paternalism and Luciano Fluidi said the same thing. He said, people are lazy mm -hmm. and people take shortcuts. They take the path of least resistance. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, they can go to GPT and they can create something which does what they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they do have the mental faculties to see that the information is wrong and, and incomplete because frankly, a lot of experts can't. Mm -hmm. The real problem with GPT is, is that it's so plausible that the mistakes are not easy to see. Mm -hmm. Now, the first thing you said really resonated with me, which is that it's it's actually us, the the people who are, let's say, you know, early 40s, late 30s, you know, onwards, because there's two types of cognition. There's generation and discrimination. Mm -hmm. And you learn those faculties together at school. And part of the reason why GPT is such a great superpower to us is that we can still discriminate. So we, exactly. we generate, mm -hmm. we discriminate. Mm -hmm. Now, another factor to bring in is that part of the reason why GPT isn't a risk at the moment is because it's not very good yet. Now, it is very good, but it has some serious problems. Mm -hmm. And when you use it, you kind of like develop a feel for where it's good and where it's not good. Mm -hmm. so it's it's um, quite bad if you ask it open-ended questions about its internal knowledge base on things it wasn't trained on. Mm -hmm. Ask it about Noam Chomsky, it will give you an amazing response because it's yep. densely trained on stuff about Noam Chomsky. It's really, really good at things inside the context window, very mm -hmm. high resolution. So basically anything that you give it inside the context window, you summarize it, ask about it, generate mm -hmm. code, it almost never makes mistakes, right? But, um, but it does still make mistakes. If you ask it to generate a script, mm. it has this kind of character to it, which is very monolithic. It doesn't seem very human. It's very constant in style. So if you want to produce a good script with it, you have to kind of adopt this hierarchical recursive process. Where yes. You segment it into bits and you kind of change the style on things and you change things. And you're actually doing this kind of like reflexive process over many steps mm. and that's something that requires a lot of intuition and a lot of knowledge but the interesting thing though is in the future that won't be necessary because mm -hmm. it will become so good that in a single step it will produce something which is just done mm. and it's, it's almost like the more you engage with the meta process the more you understand it the more engaged you are with it mm -hmm. and all of these risks that we're talking about are attenuated mm. but what when it becomes so good that you don't even bother engaging anymore you just say oh it's done yeah well i think like you said i think you know it will i think our senses will become fine-tuned to when something is mm, being produced by a gpt style model and when it's not and i think i think the recursive process is really important to show students how to use these technologies because i don't think what anyone's suggesting is that, that you know the, the concept of an essay should be just something that is um you, you know you put the question into gpt and you, you get the answer back i think you know, it, it speaks, I think, to what examination is, if it is possible to do that. I mean, if if, if what we're basically saying, and I, I remember, you know, it's from school, from our school days, that I remember I, I had a, a way of writing essays that I knew was going to get me a good mark because I knew the structure. You know, I knew what the exam board were looking for. And so in, in a way, we were we were doing what you know a gpt model does we just we just churn the same stuff that we know is following the right structure we have to put the first bit is going to put our point of view then we say that the the counter arguments and then we summarize and it is somewhat formulaic the process of writing an essay so i, I think what gpt is trying is taking away is some of the mechanics of 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 that process but the ideas themselves you know, there is a, I think there is a lot to be said for students that can then elevate that GPT output to something that really reflects them and is their, their, their way of describing a particular or their, 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 um, their unique style of writing. And I think you're right that GPT is, is somewhat, uh, it gives you a certain GPT style answer. And I know you, obviously you can prompt to, to kind of encourage it to be a start in a different style, but I think a good student would still be able to do a better job of it at the moment than a GPT model would do. But, you know, I, I like the idea that students are able to to use this technology in a way that is that elevates their own thinking. And I, I you know, I, I really hope that we find ways to, to embed this technology into the curriculum in a way that doesn't make students 
see it as the enemy first of all but also doesn't make students rely on it as a crutch there's a narrow path i think that we can take that that really tries to tries to find the middle ground between these two ideals and i don't think we're beyond being able to do this but it has to be really carefully managed otherwise we're going to end up we stray too far one side or the other and we end up just teaching students the wrong thing about education about what it means to learn um so yeah i i think i think if, as, we need to encourage students like you say to think critically and that that means using all of the tools at their disposal critically and not just saying well the internet is something i should use critically but gpt4 is de facto correct and i should never question anything that comes out of it um yeah yeah i mean what you said really resonated with me about the schematic nature of let's say essay writing mm. we, we all know that it's basically a form of overfitting mm. um all of the people in my computer science course that did really well on the exams didn't know computer science very well exactly because yeah. you go through all of the past papers and there's certain patterns and yeah. schematics and unfortunately what language models have told us about ourselves is that we are very schematic mm -hmm. and it all comes down to this mimicry thing there's always a chorus of people who say well that's not really thinking mm. that's just mimicry mm. and even with creativity it's exactly the same thing you know there's there's a schematic element and there's also a completely random element mm. and not much space in between so you know if you're looking for this beautiful space of human cognition that's neither schematic nor completely random mm -hmm. you'll be searching for a very long time um, and the way people use generative models, I mean, maybe we can talk about art as well, is that it's a very random process. So mm -hmm. you, you might be sitting in a, in a coffee shop and you, you see someone walk across the street and you say, oh, I'm just going to put that into my prompt. And you just go on this random journey. Mm. So that's quite random. Or you might just say, well, I'm going to look at what other people are doing and I'm going to steal their prompts. And you just get this kind of um, combination, don't you? Mm. Yeah, exactly. Um you know, I, I like I, I like the idea that uh, we stop marking students on their ability to to conform to a certain structure that we're expecting in the essay. But the idea itself should be what we're marking. We we need to mark the we need to mark the student and not the essay, if that makes sense. The the essay. I think what chat you know any sort of GPT model has shown us is that the essay structure is something that is no longer um, fair game for for marking and that. By saying, like you said, a, a student who writes a good essay about computer science or a student that writes a good structured essay about history that sort of just doesn't stray too far from the um, the mark scheme, you know, how good a historian or a computer scientist are they? Would it not be more impressive to see, to receive an essay that is full of interesting ideas, full of character, full of individuality, but perhaps doesn't hit all of the uh the structured bullet points in this mark scheme and you know i i, I like the idea that uh these tools are allowing us to be a bit freer with our ex our expression and our um th that we're not maybe as constrained about how every single sentence should sound and I, and I believe me i've sat in front of proposals and i've sat in front of things that i have to write where i know exactly what i want to say and i think it's a, what i want to say is very valid and is important but I just can't structure the sentence. I'm just, you know, going it through in my head, trying to work out, do I put this first or do I put this first? What hopefully these tools are allowing us to do is to 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 move away from the nuts and bolts of writing because it's an incredibly mechanical and um, a nuanced process that actually, it's only through years of sort of doing it that we understand what a good sentence structure looks like. Yeah. Well, you know, can we sidestep that somehow and really just focus on the idea itself? And so I'm spending more time, instead of thinking about how to write a sentence about the idea, can I think about three other things related to the idea itself that I want to mention? Yeah. And that's that's the key. How do yeah. we do that? Well, you, yeah, you, you just you just nailed it. So um, first of all, going back to the, um, the benchmarks, which is basically what exam marking is, in order to make it scale, we standardize the marking scheme mm -hmm. and that truncates creativity. It creates overfitting. Exactly. And what you just said is really interesting because actually what we should be optimizing for is the meta algorithm mm -hmm. so the creative process is about i've got in my mind this meta approach of like you know generating discriminating bringing things in and maybe the next generation of education will be using language models to mark as well as create mm. um because then the marking process would be something far more abstract it's mm. like well what's the meta algorithm that they've used to create this content but then cynically you might have seen this meme that um you know, you, you use a language model to generate an email and then the person who receives the email, like, you know, turns it into bullet points 
and it's almost like you've now got this intermediate space which is completely useless like, yeah could that happen to education yeah well it, that's right i mean language has always been the mechanism through which we're trying to convey ideas and i suppose yeah once you've got two gpt models talking to each other then can we not just get to the heart of the problem which is you know, cut the email chain out and just get to the point at which we want to get to um so yeah i, I think yeah, well, it goes back to the very point that we very started with, which is, you know, language is incredibly flexible and it gives a actually an incredibly accurate impression of reality. Um, but that w within an educational setting, we we used to obsess about things like spelling and that, you know, I guess the spelling of your essay would be a major part of which it was marked. And now that's less of an issue because now everyone's spelling is going to be going through a spell check um on on ms word or, or such like and i think you know maybe maybe we're going to see the same evolution with the structure of entire sentences and paragraphs and we're not now marking as much the the uh the, the mechanics of idea conveyance but we're marking instead the idea itself and i uh, it's so important i think to 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 get to the point of uh, you know I, I would love anyone going through a history class to be marked purely on a a, a an obscure relationship that they've found between two texts that they've read, maybe one in a different class altogether and the history class that they're currently taking, or that they've done some outside reading or pulling in ideas from a, a, an entire book. And we would know that they did that rather than doing that through GPT because in their Viva, they would be asked in depth about the subject and that they could elaborate on it and they get excited by it and they convey that through, through speech. And, um, uh, you know, instead of now, you know, here's your essay and uh, yeah, this paragraph should have been a bit higher because it doesn't really convey the idea early enough. And, yeah, you know, that, that sort of thing I feel is, is a, a bit mundane, to be honest, to be marking. And, and I'd, I'd love to see the ideas themselves being questioned and challenged. Um, and that will elevate us, I think, as a, as a species, because now we have, a, a, you know, hopefully generations of people who can who can focus on what's exciting about the subject. And, you know, when we take history, we don't do it to learn how to structure an essay better. We learn it because we want to understand its implications for, for, for the, the modern world and also for the sheer joy of learning about these people in the past and thinking about how they must have, how they must have lived and how they must have thought. Um, and I, yeah, I, I just, I just think there's a huge opportunity to really use this technology to focus education on the subject and less on the the exam and the marking of that exam and the essay structure i mean we talked a lot about essay writing and and uh i guess written subjects like history geography and the humanities but i suppose it also applies to um you know, mathematics and and the sciences as well where we we can really we can use the technology to to enable students to 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 fight through roadblocks that they're having with understanding um, a, a really interesting angle for these large language models, I think, is to act as personal tutors. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I've seen, I've seen in the past, you know, with you know, my friends and their, their children, how their students are using them for things like modern languages and um, in modern foreign languages and, and and subjects where there's 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 roadblocks in understanding that they they can't express necessarily easily to their teacher or they feel embarrassed to do so or they haven't got the time to do so or the teacher doesn't have time to do so but that there is now a mechanism through which they can interactively explore a particular idea without having to resort to frankly sometimes uh you know embarrassing conversation with another human about how they don't understand something so the facelessness of a gpt model might actually in some ways be a benefit and that there's no there's an objectivity about it that is incredibly appealing for things like tutoring um so yeah i think that's an interesting angle as well yeah i completely agree with that um i mean even as a podcaster myself i've thought a lot about what our value is mm. and our value is in bridge building because loads of professors do talks on youtube mm -hmm. not many people watch them because mm. they don't understand well you know, some, sometimes professors are amazing but no like podcasting is is about helping people you know giving them tools to understand stuff mm -hmm. and if you think about the bridge building where do you build the bridge from and where do you build the, the bridge to and i've thought about creating a, a portal that people can log into to kind of like ask gpt4 questions and receive you know retrieve information from previous mm -hmm. mlst episodes and, and it can be personalized because they can say i'm a computer science undergrad and i know about these things but you know like it, it will kind of know which concepts mm -hmm. need to be introduced 
because we use a lot of um, technical language mm. and the technical language is wonderful if you understand what the language is because we've got we've all got a world model mm. and as we were saying previously about the penguins we all understand the world completely different so i assume that this is the best way to, to communicate it might not be based on the information they have available to mm -hmm. them so i really agree with that um another thing i wanted to talk about is um in a way it, it's kind of depressing that like you you can go on teams now there's this thing called co-pilot where yeah. you if you missed a meeting you can say can you summarize the meeting for me mm. and um you know what team meetings are like the information content is pretty close to zero yeah and um that's actually quite depressing because there's a sub game it's not about what was said in the meeting it's about the experience of being in the meeting there's a whole kind of social dynamic mm. similarly with education there's a whole social dynamic you're building relationships with people it's part of the human condition mm -hmm. and um, language models might risk truncating that experience and not only that information and how you understand it there's a very subjective component to it which will be truncated mm. uh, what do you think about that yeah, I think what we'll start seeing with generative AI um, is hyper personalization in so many aspects. Um, so uh, I'll come back to the point that you made there around sort of team meetings um, in a minute. I, I think one of the things maybe to say first is certainly in the creative arts, what I think we'll start to see is that you won't just have um, a track that everybody will understand and hear and and, and will go to the you know, the top of the charts or whatever the equivalent is these days. But what we'll start to see is that you will be able to subscribe or um, to to buy into a certain uh, style or a certain maybe singer's uh, model of how they, how they approach uh, creative um, production and that you will be able to listen to literally a different type of song from that singer or a different... Uh, a piece of art from that artist or or, or, or a novella from from that that writer whenever the whenever you want and that you'll be able to save that if that's one that you particularly like that becomes part of your library and that you that's the hyper personalization you will be able to create your own music on the fly i think that will happen i really do um I, you know we've talked about this for years i think I mean, personalized music and mm. i think the the quality hasn't quite been there uh, and it's interesting to think that that music is the last well, one of the last pillars through which we're we're working uh, on generative AI. The text is one of the first to fall. Images, obviously, video is now starting to get there, but it's obviously more challenging. Why is music so much more complicated? I find that really interesting. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, to take it back to your point about team meetings and, and personalization there, I think, yeah, for sure that everybody will have their own, perhaps their own model of what in a meeting is important to them. And that the CEO's large language model of a meeting may be very different and they will be able to pass it through their own prompt of what they find important than somebody who's actually you know, doing the work, maybe a programmer. Um, and so the same meeting may actually have different summarizations for different people. Um, and yes, whether you're there in person or not, I think what will be interesting is seeing what, as, a, as, a, as an individual, you carry around with you in terms of you know, generative baggage and that you might have a, a model that you, you have using within a work environment to capture what's interesting to you there. And then you might have your your music model that's, um, yeah, it, everything that you're listening to gets passed through and it will be able to generate uh, from from noise, I guess, noise vectors, what you want to listen to at that moment in time. So I think hyper-personalization is just around the corner in the work arena, but also socially and creatively as well. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, you said something interesting about, first of all, music being significantly harder than the other modalities, and, and we should just quickly uh, double click on that. But also, what, what do you think about this notion of, again, we, we think we're really creative. Mm. And like if we if we did suddenly have generative music, and, and I would love that, by the way, I listen to SoundCloud and I listen to very repetitive kind mm. of like, um, I don't even know the type, it's called like Future Garage and Wave, but I'm sure you could generate it. But, you know, in my mind, I, I feel that a human has gone through this creative process and they've created something which is not on the manifold. Mm -hmm. But it probably is on the manifold, isn't it? That, that's the thing. So yeah. do, do you cynically think that there, there is no new type or paradigm of music that could be created? Are we truncating the possibilities by, by doing this? No, I, I'm, I'm optimistic about the future of all creative arts because, like you said, I think there are things that sit off, off the manifold. And by that, you know, what, what we mean is that the training data only takes us so far today. And that I think 
ultimately we are still interpolating. It's just that a lot of the interpolation looks like extrapolation. Hmm. But I think, you know, if you, if you boil it down to what, what mod- models can do, they are very, very adept at interpolation between different points on this manifold. And it, you know, sometimes that appears like something completely new, but it's actually a blend of, you know, thousands and thousands of different genres that create something that appears new. However, having said that, there are steps that are taken within music, for example, that just seem to create a new sound that is genuinely interesting that you would, you couldn't really describe as a mixture of previous um, genres. I mean, if you think about, say, if you had a large uh, music model that was trained on music up until the, you know, the, the late 60s, could you create music that sounds like 80s synth? Yeah. You know, it's like, well, maybe not because the technology just wasn't there. And also it's a sound that doesn't really come across in any previous music from, from you know, the, the 60s backwards. So I think what we need to do is encourage, and again, it, it will elevate and help us to, to, to create not just, I mean, look at, you know, music today is, is, is by and large a huge machine. And even without generative models, I feel like some of the some of the creativity has somewhat been sapped out of the the music industry because it's become a a mechanism for generating revenue rather than for creative output and and new ideas that are too risky a lot of the time. Um, and yes, there are people who do still create wonderful music through largely interpolating the same ideas. I mean, look at Ed Sheeran's been taken to court, hasn't he, over using the same four chords as pretty much every pop song, but it's his music's still wonderful and thousands and millions of people listen to it. So we shouldn't treat interpolation as a, you know, something that should be sort of sneered at. I think it's, I think it's an important part of music making. It's just that now I think artists have the ability and I would like to see artists embrace the idea that their sound can be used in a myriad different ways. Uh, not just their, you know, their one or two uh, top selling charts, you know, singles. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, interesting. I mean, cause one thought on that is there might be um, an analog with language. So, um, you know, Chomsky had this idea that there should be a generative grammar. Mm. And unfortunately, all grammars leak. Um, but certainly we were talking about the cross-pollination between programming languages and, and our language. And uh, th- there is a formal grammar for mm. Python, not leaky at all. And, and similarly, there's a difference between sounds which are nice to listen to. So we recognize certain things as music. Mm-hmm. And that is determined presumably by um, physical architectural configurations in our cochlear and our brain and our mm-hmm. processing system and so on so there might be a kind of grammar for music which these models are learning mm. and then it's just a kind of a case of of um, creativity combinations and sounds so you could argue in in some sense that the domain is is quite restricted mm. yeah I, I think um you know, especially with music making, I, I think one of the interesting things about why this has been such a, it, it's actually one of the harder domains to to solve, um, goes back to the fact, first of all, there's not as much training data. So text is obviously hugely uh, prolific and we have a huge amount of it in which to train um, and to learn from. And large language models do scale remarkably well with the training data set. Um, but also you're right that there seems to be something very very particular about why some things sound good and one why some things don't sound, don't sound good and we 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 really resonate as humans to the idea of um that there are there are long term dependencies within a piece of music that we we enjoy the recapitulation of an idea or we enjoy the sometimes the repetition of an idea and that repetition has to be sort of precise and it has to be um yeah and, and, and maybe with a small adjustment to it that, that sort of elevates it um, and certainly within, I think within in pop music or, or modern, modern music, I think what we're seeing is that a lot of the time these ideas can be in some way, um, you know, forced and can be in some way sort of, um, embedded into the music without too much sort of creative process. Um, and, and maybe what generative modeling will allow us to do is get back to the old school idea of, can we come up with something that sounds you know, a bit different from to people's ears and that it's because we can generate this stuff now at scale that there's there's more opportunity to to get things wrong and suddenly something will burst through that just sounds fresh new different rather than having to take the risk on that idea because it's it's just it's so difficult to come up with something like that and take the risk on it so 
yeah, I, I think I'm still hugely optimistic that creators will continue to create interesting and and a, a novel and 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 um, really powerful ideas, but also support it by technologies that allow them to do that a lot faster and allow them to do that in a way that um, that they can still stamp their impression onto the music. Mm. Um, the, the other point I think to make is that people don't just like music for the, the the objectivity of music; they like it for the personal story as well, and that's something that no AI model is going to be able to give you: is the personal struggle of the musician, mm. or the personal, um, you know, the 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 hero's arc, if you like, of this musician's story. And so, where the human aspect comes in will be more around storytelling and more around the. I mean, you know, the the idea that albums progress from one to the next and that there's, there is some sort of progression. It's not just every piece of music sits on its own, but there is a, something about the, the artist that's embedded into that song. Um, and that's what people buy into. And I think we'll still need that. Yeah. And uh, I mean, this is getting into the philosophy of AI art, but um, as, exactly as you said, there's an intention. Um, you know, what, what, what did the artist intend? Mm. What was the artist experiencing? Um, you know the the ontology in mm. philosophical terms. There's there's all of the kind of contextual information. So all all of these things construct meaning, mm -hmm. and there is an intuition that AI art, you know, at at least attenuates all of those contextual factors because it just becomes an artifact. Mm. Um, but yeah, in in a sense, um, you were saying something very interesting about um, the kind of the correctness of a piece. So like, with music, it, it there's it doesn't really other than following something which sounds musical, there's not a clear notion of correctness. Mm. With AI art, you know, Gary Marcus spoke about compositionality and, and the art which is generated still needs to make sense in our world model. Yep. And then you move over to language and then you've got this concept of factfulness and knowledge, mm -hmm. which seems to be an even more robust form of like, it needs to be a certain way and not another way. And I was going to ask you about factfulness because that's one thing that language models cannot do. Mm -hmm. So they they cannot verify facts, and there are lots of kludges for mm -hmm. kind of doing that. But so so you could argue that it's not really saving students any time if they actually have to go and fact check everything. Mm -hmm. But I just wondered, like, could you sort of like extend that out into art and music? That you know, d does it does it need to be correct in the same way? Well, yeah, I mean, even music has, like you say, there's rules and there's form around what a cadence should sound like. And the music seems to convey something very you know, deep within our our psyche and certain patterns and, and chord progressions and um, and rhythms and uh, and timbres. They, they seem to have some direct parallel with our reality. So whether it's a, you know, a high energy um, uplifting beat or whether it's something that's reflective or we, we can use these descriptive words within music, you know, all, the, it seems to be able to capture all of human, um, yeah, all of human existence seems to exist within in the musical sphere. And so I think what generative AI is, is, is doing is almost trying to find what the parallels are of um, of these human you know, conditions within just the simple progression of notes in the same way that it's doing with the progression of tokens and, and, and words. Um, but the data simply isn't there or there isn't as quant much quantity. So it's much harder to train the models, certainly within the public domain. And I, yeah, I, I think, I think long range dependency is also a much bigger problem with, um, with music because you, know, you mentioned sort of factfulness and I guess music doesn't have the notion of a fact. It's not, nothing's ever wrong in music, but there's certainly some, some things that would sound incorrect or would sound not, um, not in fitting with the, 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 the four bars that we heard, you know, just maybe 30 seconds ago. And so I, I think a piece of music is, is in some ways it has to be even more precise because if, if we feel that it's too, um, the music doesn't progress anywhere. There's no journey through the piece. Then we are somewhat unsettled by it. We don't particularly sort of hear of it as a as a con as a as a whole and as a concise unit. We sort of just hear of it as sort of segments of four bars that each sound a little bit different. So it needs to have that contextual long range dependency. I think. 
I mean, that, that's actually a really interesting distinction between visual art and auditory art, because, you know, there, there's always the question of what is the value of art? Mm. And some people say that it's, as you said, the subject of experience, the intention, the ontology, blah, blah, blah. Um, some people say it's about representation. Mm -hmm. So in visual art, um, a lot of art is representing the world as we experience it. Mm -hmm. And music isn't really representing the world. Mm. It's representing something else. And I'm yep. not sure if that makes a kind of categorical difference in how we generate it. Yeah, it's a, it, a fascinating. I mean, music music is probably the, the domain. I, I, I mean, I, I'm a musician myself. I play the cello and I, I've always found very, very interesting the idea that there's people would sit for hours and hours just listening to just sound waves. I mean, mm. you know, you go to the theatre, you can sort of understand there's a direct connection there between reality and what people are doing on stage and that you come away all with the same exactly the same understanding about what's happened maybe subtle interpretation or differences or you go to an art gallery and you can you can see what people are trying to convey and maybe modern art less so but at least there's a still everybody is viewing the same um the same body of work music is entirely different because i think well first of all you know people's auditory impressions of what's happening will be will be different but then also there is no direct connection music doesn't really exist in that form in nature um we have sort of animal sounds and um nature you know, nature produces its own music but a lot of the time the, the music that we're hearing you know we hear beethoven we're not hearing his interpretation of how a bird sounds we're hearing his his way of converting audio into fear or into uh jubilation or, or triumph and so you know I, it's interesting that we can still we can still all hear the same passage of music and feel those emotions. No two, no one would say, or very unlikely somebody would say, this sounds jubilant. And then someone would say, I'm, this sounds awful. I can't believe how, you know, major minor keys, major keys to all of us sound uplifting just because we've raised the third of the chord and minor chords sound dark and, and scary. Um, and, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure actually why that is. Why is it that if you change this one note by a semitone that suddenly you move from jubilation to fear? Um, and what I suppose generative AI models are trying to do is map, the, yeah, to uncover the, the the unwritten rules of music. Um, and what makes music, I think, so fascinating is that language, we can at least describe the grammar. We can say, well, it's wrong to put this adjective before this noun or, or whatever it might be in a certain language. But music, there are no rules, but there are implicit rules. There's no explicit uh, thing to say, this is why... Um, you need to, you know, you need to finish this with a chord, a five chord, and then a, and a root chord. But we just seem to have all the same understanding that that is how a piece of music should should end, and there's a finality at the end of that. Um, so yeah, I, I think it will be really fascinating to see how generative models approach music because we can't say to them, we can't we can't judge them on the same way of being well. This is perfectly grammatically structured. You know, we've seen, um, you know, GPT four very rarely makes grammatical mistakes if ever but what does that look like in music we don't have the rule book we can't say we don't know what ai music is going to generate basically we can only say what sounds good and what doesn't sound good to our ears and that will be different per person um so yeah i think there's a huge there is a bit of a difference there between language modeling and music modeling yeah it's absolutely fascinating yeah and um it reminded me a little bit of um nagel's essay on what's it like to be a bat and he was talking about this potential of an objective phenomenology and i'm sorry for using buzzwords i basically mean your kind of conscious experience mm -hmm. and because you, you were kind of alluding to there being an objective mapping between certain rules or schemes of music mm. and how they make you feel mm. and it's probably a bit of both maybe, maybe there is some deterministic objective mapping and some of it is actually more random than we would like to um, admit mm -hmm. for example when we all go to a music festival and um, you know, with various levels of inebriation, we um, we're convinced that we're having the same experience, mm -hmm. and in many ways we are because yeah. we're ex we're experiencing the same music. We're in the same space and time. Mm -hmm. You know, when you send a recording to your friends on on the phone, they don't get it, do they? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. They there. Yeah, they don't get it. Um, <laughs> but um, but by the same token, when you go on a roller coaster ride and uh, you kind of experience fear, but you can, or when you do a presentation, you can kind of convince yourself, no, it's excitement because mm. it's the same feeling. You know, mm -hmm. like the mapping is is subjective, mm. and and that's the thing. You're in this space of of existence and consciousness and ontology and all these words, mm. 
and um, music does seem to be far more in that very kind of like subjective space compared to the other modalities. Which yeah, actually- and, 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 and hugely reflects the culture in which it's produced as well. I mean, I'm talking purely about Western classical music and Western pop music, but if you trained a large language, uh, a large music model on, say, the pentatonic scales of, of um, Asian music or you know, music which involves a lot more... Um, there's less tonal and more um more about the the rhythm or the you know drum the drum beats the the sort of the instinctive kind of uh, drive of the music rather than intonation mm. i think you would you 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 do have, end up capturing something about the culture of the the people who have created that that music um so yeah i, I think as well we if we're training music models i think it's really important in the same way that we don't want to introduce biases in large language models by uh, you know, only training on on Western data sets or only training on English data sets. I think you'll see the same thing with music, and that what large lang- uh, large music models will have to do is is find a way of representing different uh, genres of music all in the same sort of latent space. And it'd be interesting, wouldn't it, to see if there's a uh, the same latent space can capture the beauty of a Rachmaninoff piano concerto as Ed Sheeran's latest number one single. Do you need different? music music models to do that or are they actually part of the same uh, manifold yeah. um because they're using the same chords they're using the same progressions but the, the 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 whole idea of those two pieces those two things is completely different one is something you can put on very you know, background music to listen to for, for a short moment of enjoyment and the other one is something that is is conveying so much so much more about that composer's ideas and yeah, I, I I just find it really interesting to think how those two things might might compete, and and I think as well with with language modeling, you're always dealing with sets of tokens about words or or um, parts of words. With music, there are no such thing as tokens because you either well you either model model music as a, as a sequence of notes where those notes have duration, they have pitch, they have a, a, yeah timbre, but or you order it as the waveform itself. In which case they can, you know, an Ed Sheeran track could be modelled in the same way as a, mm. a symphony because ultimately they're both in the same medium of of of, uh, of waveforms with frequency and and uh, and volume and so forth amplitude. So how do we how do we as uh, generative modelling practitioners model music? Do we just keep it in waveform space or do we resort to notes? But then as soon as we resort to notes, we're biasing towards Western music because a lot of genres of music don't have that sort of um, representation of music on the page they are passed down through word of mouth or they're passed down through um call and response you know and and improvisation mm-hmm. yeah so interesting to how, see how we develop this yeah i know and um i guess like, something that's just struck me is you know we were surprised that um we thought truck drivers would have their jobs automated first and it was actually the information workers and, and maybe mm. we can talk a bit about democratization in, in general because this technology is, is, is very democratizing but um, similarly, critics of AI thought that um, it would be okay for epistemology or for knowledge, and actually, it's it's not very good at objective facts. Mm-hmm. And we always thought it wouldn't do ontology or conscious experience mm-hmm. in subjective states. And as we've just been alluding to, yes, it can to quite a large extent. Yep. So um, in many ways, our intuitions have been turned upside down. Let, let's just quickly touch on this democratization point, though, which, which is that um, in in a way. Um, you you could be someone who doesn't speak English very well and you can now write beautiful essays, you can uh, do programming, you can do a whole bunch of stuff. So Mm -hmm. um, do you think that that kind of democratization is is a good thing? Yeah, I do. In in short, I think it levels the playing field wonderfully. Um, We've always had the, I guess, the issue of some people having access to the best tools and the best quality tools education and i think what large language models are have the potential to do is give everybody at least a a fighting chance if they have access to these models of being able to being able to get started and you know, not become necessarily expert but at least not feel they're working with a blank page and i think large language models just solve the blank page problem for so many different areas um that you know you're, you're no longer if you're like creating a react app or I was the other day building a website um, for for some GPT demos that we're doing as a company, and I, I just wanted something on page that I could get started with, and you know, within thirty minutes there was the website um, mm. with all of the functionality that I wanted, and then I took over from there, and we've now got you know that that website live. So I think 
yes, I'm excited at the potential for this technology to accelerate um, what we're capable of. And I think it's because it unlocks potential in people that not wouldn't necessarily have, have had that potential unlocked through lack of opportunity and lack of um, access to to a, a baseline level of of um, understanding or a baseline uh, sort of platform of, of, of intelligence about a s- certain subject. That's not to say I think that that's all you need and that everybody now is a React developer or everybody now is a website builder or has the ability to write an essay on uh, or a book about a particular subject uh, to, to great levels of detail. But I just think we've raised the floor of the of the problem and i think that's really exciting um yeah, yeah. although yeah, even on that at the moment though so gpt4 is you're limited by the context window and when something goes wrong and it's remarkably good as yeah I, said, I did a react app over mm. the weekend as well and um it to be honest now the the failure mode is is often in um the clarity of my instruction mm-hmm. so there's a bit of an alignment problem so it, it did the right thing it did exactly what i told it to do my yeah. instruction was wrong and um and you and sometimes the failure mode is i haven't properly copied the text back to the mm. react app i've inadvertently deleted a line sometimes gpt4 says dot 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 you know um use the existing code yeah, yeah. Implement, you know and i've like not noticed and i've pasted that in and it was actually my fault um but admittedly though there are there are still a few failures and that means i actually need to dig in and i have to understand how references and mm. callbacks work in react which you know it can be quite quite onerous and so mm-hmm. on um we're in the uk mm-hmm. and um we've got hyperinflation our economy is is really really bad compared to the rest of the eu and we don't have a manufacturing base anymore for the mm. last 30 years we've moved into this realm of you know, high finance and information workers, knowledge workers, I guess you would call it. Mm-hmm. And um, you could argue now that with the advent of this technology, um, our core value as an economy has just become diminished because it's so easy to automate that work. Mm. Yeah, uh, I, I, I would say, you know, we're, we're, I still see this as a tool and I, I do think we shouldn't necessarily sort of fear this as something that is going to replace or completely um overall you know human um output um you know i i do think yes there will be some jobs that are now a lot more um based around ideas and around the sort of um conceptual uh con- you know, concepts i guess than the, the the mechanics of writing or the mechanics of summarization uh the legal profession obviously is a, is a good example of this where a large part of the the expertise is in knowing where to look for information and knowing how to summarize very complex documents and sort of pull out relevant information and you know if large language models are going to be used in this space then i think there's a potential there for great disruption but having said that you know i don't think that that it will mean that there's a lot of people walking around without a a job i just think that we've always found that that jobs move and that that there are these people will find other ways to to offer their services that is beyond the mundane and and i think that's that's where the great application of this is is it helps people to move away from repetitive and um formulaic work towards something that is hopefully of a a higher order level of cognition um so i yeah I, i don't I never like sort of the idea that there's a, a an uncontrollable threat. I, I think the the idea always tends to be disproven sooner or later, yeah. um, and that we'll just find other ways to engage ourselves, um, and that's for the better. So um, Eliezer Yudkowsky was on Lex and been on a bunch of podcasts, and um, I, I must admit I've shifted my position a bit because I've shifted from thinking that you know what they're talking about is completely crazy to um i think there's a lot of very interesting stuff i mean they say don't talk about intelligence talk about capability mm. and when you use gpt4 like this thing is very capable it's doing admittedly it's doing the right thing for the wrong reasons it's mm. doing it in a different way to we to how we do it but it's doing stuff in some cases better than than our capability but the the real thing that i strongly disagree on is this notion of a recursive self-improving superintelligence. Mm-hmm. So what do you think about that? I, I agree. I think that's uh, also 
sort of comic book thinking and sci-fi thinking. And I, I think it's very easy to fall into this trap of if if it can start programming itself, then it becomes super intelligent. Um, and I don't, I just don't see that as being a, a, a viable threat. And I think it's very, it, it's something that I've heard, I've heard sort of, yeah, quite sort of respectable people sort of talk about and the, the idea that suddenly we're going to all wake up and it's sort of designed itself to, um, to have nefarious, uh, take nefarious actions in the world. And suddenly we're all, um, it's, it's the end of humanity. But I think, I think what we need to realize is that, you know, I, I go back to the point that what we've built is something that's very capable of predicting the next word. And I know that's not something to be taken lightly, but ultimately we need to understand that there's no embodiment at the moment of these concepts. And we, you know, we don't have the idea of, uh, these large language models being something that is able to, it, it operates basically within this theoretical space and not something that is operating, um, in the physical world. So I, I don't really, I, I don't really agree that there's more harm than good that's going to come of this technology. I think we'll end up seeing it being used much more for positive and for for good purposes than it than running the risk of an of a of a self replicating or self um, improving AI. Um, because I think it, it goes back to as well this po- this concept of will and wanting a particular outcome. And whilst we might be able to give the impression of this through goal-oriented uh, chaining of large language models like AutoGPT, ultimately, I, I still think there's something missing and that, that we don't really have the ability to give anything a proper will to do what it needs in it. So I, I'm with you on the idea that uh, self-recursiveness is not something we need to worry about at the moment. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of things there. Um, I kind of agree with you. The, the thing is, I've, I've spent so long now, you know, reading Chalmers, thinking about all this stuff. And when I first started reading about consciousness in silico i thought it was a completely crazy idea and i you know i kind of naturally agree with um, mm. so but the more you think about it the more you kind of think well maybe maybe you could have consciousness in in silico and, and then the, you know intentionality a lot of people argue that that's strongly related to mm. consciousness and um yeah so th- there's this question of would it have agency? Would it want to kill us all? Mm. And then even if it could self-replicate, that's interesting as well. So we're not talking about an intellectual Santa Claus machine where it kind of like materializes itself into the physical world. It mm. might just be creating little computer viruses that kind of replicate around the internet. And mm. and those, those things will kind of make it more likely that the thing doesn't get turned off or something like that. Mm. So, you know, like there's a plausibility scale. So that's kind of like one step up on the plausibility scale. And then I think the thing at the top of, of the unlikelihood scale is that there's something about the autonomous recursive nature in of itself that can improve in, you know its intelligence and that i take issue with because look at auto gpt mm. connor Leahy even said oh you know I've, i was warning you guys about this you know this is this is why i didn't talk about recursivity because i knew i knew that all of this shit was going to kick off mm. and i'm looking at it and thinking well this just confirmed what i thought all along like yeah. it's crap it doesn't, it doesn't do anything but um, yeah. But w- what is it about this recursive thing that you think they're worried about? Right. So I suppose th- the main thing is I think people are now worried about the fact that large language models have the ability to, to code and to code pretty well. Mm-hmm. And I suppose they are then sort of making the leap to, OK, well, if we've got large language models that can code and can reason, therefore it follows that they will want to code themselves. And there is a huge leap there between a large language model outputting some code because it's been asked to output some code to then saying it's going to find the ability and, and people say things like oh, it will leap onto the internet it, it it doesn't for me sort of it, it's a non sequitur to say if it can code therefore it's able to sort of just leap onto the internet find its code base and start putting pull requests in i think we also need to remember that we have the ability now to write code that can do a lot of damage on the internet without AI and and like you say, viruses that can spread rapidly. So we need to not sort of uh, blend or, or blur the lines between what AI can do and what it's giving us and the ability to write code that can do a lot of damage because the two are separate. And, you know, we, we have now viruses that can self replicate and, and mutate and adapt to different scenarios without the need for LLMs. Um, all LLMs give us the ability to do is is 
is apply the same model in a range of scenarios. And I suppose this is what people are worried about is that if you can deploy one model that can, in one instance, write some code, but also in the other instance, talk to a human on an email to convince them to give them their password, then you don't need to suddenly have different models to do each of these different things and that you can deploy one agent that has the ability to do everything all together. Um, so I think there is a there is a, a valid concern of people using the technology nefariously and I, I don't doubt that there will be some significant news articles and stories about how this technology is being used you know for, for bad reasons however I don't I don't want to sort of fall into the trap of thinking well it's the technology itself that therefore needs to be destroyed and therefore needs to be not progressed but we need to find ways to stop bad actors doing bad things which has always been the case to be honest um you know for example um Cybercrime is a, is an area where I think large language modeling will really start to uh, have large impacts, and I think you know even even then you know the, the same it will be the same challenges that we face with cybercrime, so detection and uh, defense and being able to quickly adapt to new scenarios that haven't been seen before, um, and it will just be about understanding how this technology may accelerate these ideas, but it won't be a different kind of attack or a different kind of um, entity that we're dealing with, we've just we just need to understand that there are now ways to generate large amounts of text very very quickly or large amounts of code very very quickly. But I don't see it as being something that will ultimately recurse back to it wanting to update its own code base to achieve a particular means. But I totally understand your. This is something that is very. I can see why people think very deeply about this, and that there is not a. I'm not willing to say that I'm 100% certain that I'm right, <laughs> basically. Well, that's the thing. There's always a bit of a lingering doubt. And this yeah, is, exactly. This is why yeah. this narrative has become so pervasive, because they always say, well, do you really know? Yeah. And then they say, well, you know, yeah, it's it's a low likelihood, high magnitude event. Therefore, mm -hmm. we have to take it seriously. Um, you know, Pascal's wager and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, and I can imagine a situation, even with GPT-4, that if you actually give it shell access to an internet-connected machine, it could probably create some kind of self-replicating code. And there will, I'm sure, be some big scandal in the next six, mm. 12 months that there'll be a virus circulating on the internet, which was created by yeah, GPT-4. So for sure. Mm. All of that stuff, you know, definitely could happen. And, and then um, the intentionality thing, just look at Bing GPT, like whether, whether or not it's mimicry it does appear to have intentions and mm. thoughts and you know i could see it potentially doing certain things that could be harmful mm. so um yeah i don't know it's uh yeah yeah i, I exactly i mean I, I i suppose part of me doesn't want to believe that that would be possible and i suppose that's maybe coloring my thoughts somewhat but also i really don't think i i don't i don't want to believe that this is something that is is going to be something we're seeing, um, it, whether in the near future or in the far future. I think we've we've got the ability to maintain contain control of the technology. Uh, ultimately, I do I do believe that. I don't think we're going to see runaway AGI. Whether we see an incredibly powerful general intelligences, I'm more uh, I'm more convinced that that is true. But I don't. I suppose the differentiator there is that whether it's a runaway, and I think that's the the key is that I guess people people on the, the one far side of the, 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 the opinion would say, well, you know, I don't think we'll end up having control over it and that it will end up being something that we've lost the ability to turn off. Hmm. That's the bit I probably would say is is not in line with my opinion. I think it's I think we will always maintain control and we have the ability to do so. Um but as I say, like I, the technology is moving so fast it's difficult to 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 really sort of say with any certainty. Um yeah, I mean, I, th I think part of the problem is they they imagine this kind of demon, which is this super intelligent agent that's going to take over the world. And mm. I think the reality would be much more mundane than that. It will be we already have lots of hackers writing yeah. self replicating programs and and so on. And the thing is, like, if you look at how corporations solve this problem, they force everyone to install security agents on their machines, mm -hmm. and um, it's something that I I always hate doing mm. but it's not my machine so i don't particularly care um but if the government told me to install a security agent on my personal machine i would absolutely lose my shit mm. i would not let that happen mm -hmm. 
And could you see something like that actually happen? Because you know the the problem here is that other than doing that, how could how could they possibly regulate this technology? Mm. Yeah, I think I I think that there's the people's you know people's fear over this, like you say, stems from the fact that they believe that there's a uh, an overruling sort of demon like you described that kind of wants to end humanity and, and desperately doesn't want to see its creator um you know it, it, as part of its future but i i don't i don't see the leap between having the technology that we do at the moment or even slightly more advanced version of it and and want and seeing that agent in the world and the, the point there that you mentioned around you know if we're being asked to install stuff onto our computers i i think that is if anything an, an entirely sort of I think we might, you know, see that anyway, regardless of AI. I think sort of overreaching on the state side is something that you know we're all sort of used to seeing. And I think that if if we're seeing AI proliferate through the world, that it might be something that um, that we as personal you know, individuals want to kind of protect ourselves against. But that I, I don't see a sort of big bang event that leads to. Uh, huge amounts of regulation happening on AI overnight because of some sort of catastrophic event. And I suppose this is where a lot of the runaway AI, AGI ideas end, is that they believe that there's going to be some sort of catastrophic event that that ends up being a significant moment that we we look back on and we say, wow, I wish we'd have regulated against this sooner. You know, and it's, there's often a parallel, isn't there, drawn between, you know, the Manhattan Project and what we're seeing at the moment with, um, with AI being developed. But I suppose I, I don't I don't really see the parallel there too much because I, I suppose the the discovery that we've made is that 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 language modeling in itself can give the impression of intelligence, and that almost like is the the scientific discovery that we've made, um, and that if we're going to start drawing parallels to things like um, you know nuclear weaponry, then we we start to pull in the human aspect of why these technologies are dangerous. You know, just because we've we've discovered splitting the atom that that is the discovery that we've made now we need to decide what we do with it um and but i don't see it in the same way that there's going to be this big event that causes us to reevaluate whether the tech the discovery that we've made is is a danger or not i think you're right that it'll be much more mundane and that we'll end up seeing ai proliferate but in a way that doesn't really cause the um cause us to go this is horrendous what we've just created we need to do something immediately okay well let me um give you a thought experiment which i think is quite interesting so to these people in the rationalist community intelligence is literally um being able to predict the future and, mm -hmm. and connor Leahy is a huge fan of um, friston mm. he was a co-interviewer on the first interview we did with him so, mm. so so in a sense these people think the same as you they, they, they think that when you predict beyond a certain horizon that you get these like runaway events. Yeah. So let's say we had an intelligent and by the way the reason why I don't think it's possible is because I know that if you if you take these trajectories these predict prediction trajectories you're traversing an exponentially large space. Mm -hmm. But it turns out that's what everyone said about language and it mm -hmm. turned out to be wrong. Mm -hmm. So what if they could actually predict our actions, you know, let's say a certain number of steps into the future and being able to do so created these kind of like um, transient capabilities mm. that could lead to doom. Um, is that completely far-fetched? Well, I, I suppose I'd go back to the, the earlier point, which is that we already have the ability to write very, 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 very complex programs without the need for a large language model to do bad things in the world. And that we need to remember that there is a, there is a line that needs to be sort of drawn between computer programming in itself and the ability to create agents and entities that enact things out in the world that are considered damaging and the ability to create um, create code and create programs that are uh, that are prompted in a certain way to, to, to do a certain thing and I suppose what what these people would say is that uh, there's going to be a blending of those two things so that the suddenly you are not fixed to a certain set of code in order to deploy your agent but you can deploy it very very loosely with a set of prompts or a set of instructions to generally achieve a certain goal but the, your point there of the fact that this space is, is exponentially large and therefore it will have to find its way 
in, through a very sort of complicated sequence sequence of events in order to achieve its goal. And the beauty of programming without large language models is that it is able to do so. It, it, you, you know exactly what you've deployed, and it's solving this one particular trajectory time and time again. And that if we we are able to create models that can, in some small way traverse not just one trajectory but also have the ability to spread and to find their own way through the path through through the through the exponential space whether that creates whether that creates danger i i still i still don't think so because i think it would be more efficient in many ways to actually just code up a series of agents to do the things you want it to do rather than deploy a large language model to try to find it out for itself mm. Um, and I think if there were ways to do that, that we would have already seen, and, you know, we do see cyber attacks, which are complex and involve, um, you know, agents that in some cases wait for years on infrastructure before deploying and can, can, can wait and monitor different, different parts of the network, um, for a certain event to happen or a certain uh, vulnerability to become apparent. So what, what, what we need to, what we need to really understand is whether there is, is there benefits to deploying an agent? that and i'm thinking i'm thinking from the um from the bad guys perspective what's the what's their incentive to deploy a large language language model based um uh, yeah, virus generation uh, agent for example rather than just do it now with exactly a particular attack trajectory and building a, a series of um of attacks that are that are, that are targeted and do one thing very, very well, rather than a large language model that does a lot of things, you know, eighty percent well. I'm not sure that there's a benefit at the moment to to doing that, but I'm, you know, I've always been optimistic about these things. I don't think that we should be we should be cautious, but not terrified <laughs> at the potential, and that there's there's things that we can start to conversations that we should be having basically around this but there needs to be it needs to be grounded in reality and it grounded in you know not 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 hyperbole but real specific use cases of i can write this today to do this how are you going to defend against that mm -hmm. and i haven't heard i haven't really like you say the auto gpt stuff is impressive at face value but as soon as you dig under the surface you realize this actually gets itself in knots and that's not to say you know it's not going to do this in future and that we need to be cautious but i, I think everything should be grounded in scenario based reality of what's possible and that we shouldn't we shouldn't leap 20 steps into the future and say well what about this happening when we're still here we need to understand what's in the immediate vicinity an issue make sure we have the right people talking about these things and are aware of the potential consequences and take actions take actions based on what we can see happening today rather than the sci-fi version of the future mm -hmm. um yeah cool david absolute pleasure thank you very much for joining us today oh it's been really fascinating thanks very much for having me on really enjoyed it my pleasure my pleasure